Please all rise for the ASEAN Anthem. Welcome to the second ASEAN 2017 Dialogues, Business Beyond Borders. To formally welcome us to today's event, let us call on ASEAN 2017 Committee on Media Affairs and Strategic Communications Vice Chair and Logistics Head, Assistant Secretary Kissinger Reyes of the Presidential Communications Operations Office. Ms. Doris Magsaysay Ho and Suyin Lee from Asia Society, Attorney Alan Revote 
from DPI, Mr. Hill Gonzalez, Ms. Cheryl Quintana, Attorney Christine Alcantara, Mr. Jose Avilino Flores, Dr. Neil Adrian Cabiles, Ms. Katrina Luna Abelarde, Professor Fernando Rojas, and Ms. Elizabeth Lee. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Today marks another achievement as we continue the ASEAN 2017 Dialogues. I'd like to thank all of you for your continued support in the efforts of the PCOO in reaching out to the public and keeping the citizens of ASEAN well informed. I would like to thank our colleagues from the Department of Finance, the Department of Trade and Industry for their support in this event. I'd also like to thank our partners from Asia Society, as well as our friends from AIM. I wish to appreciate your continued support in ASEAN and PCOO throughout this dialogue series. When we started this dialogue series last June 16, 2017, we at the ASEAN 2017 Committee on Media Affairs and Strategic Communications were overwhelmed by the level of support for this endeavor. People and ideas from across the region converge here at AIM, and we were able to gain meaningful and substantive, in, substantive points concerning regional and cybersecurity. These informative exchanges were able to reach thousands outside our venue and around the globe. Opportunities such as these are considered of extreme value to us in PCOO as we amplify and increase awareness of ASEAN. So today, we continue our discussions on the pressing issues of the three community pillars of ASEAN. We'll focus on the engine that drives development and progress of our nations, the economy. This part of ASEAN Dialogues Forum, entitled Business Beyond Borders, touches on the integral parts of ASEAN economic engine, such as trade and investment, innovation, production, and the institutions that safeguard the processes of the economy. As part of the thematic priorities of the Philippine chairmanship, inclusive innovation-led growth, it strives to ensure that progress and prosperity transcends political and socioeconomic boundaries. Therefore, we will not forget our brothers and sisters in the micro, small, or medium enterprises, or as we call them, SMS, MSMEs. We embrace entrepreneurship and we support the dreams of our citizens of having their own business. As a matter of fact, I believe we'll be starting our discussions today on that topic. ASEAN has fought its way through multiple major economic crises in the past decades. These events have tried to challenge ASEAN, but still, we have managed to pull through and become better and stronger. In today's part of this forum, forum series, we continue to be dynamic and proactive by discussing the matters related to the ASEAN economic community. We seek to answer questions that would further engage the private sector in a fruitful partnership with ASEAN, keeping with the theme of the Philippine chairmanship partnering for change, engaging the world. We want to establish clearer lines in securing sustainability in our business, businesses regardless of size. No matter how big or small your business is, we want success to be inclusive and attain attainable for everyone. As our region furthers its economic interconnections, we take moments like these in order to look at the challenges, merits, and strategies as we expand our markets within and outside ASEAN. I truly believe that as one of the largest economic zones and a home to 227 of the world's largest companies, the economic spotlight is now directed towards our region. 
investors and multinational companies have trusted our financial environment as we continue to become one of the most business-friendly regions in the world. I wish to thank everyone again for your support and faith in the administration, and we hope to see you all in the final segment of our ASEAN 2017 Dialogues, as well as in our other events as we celebrate 50 beautiful years of ASEAN brotherhood and camaraderie. A pleasant afternoon to everyone. Maraming salamat at mabuhay po tayong lahat. Thank you, Asik Kissinger Reyes. To welcome us to today's event and introduce our keynote speaker and moderator, may we call on the chairman of Asia Society Philippines, Ms. Doris Magsaysay Ho. Thank you. <laughs> Honorable officials of the Philippine government, members of the diplomatic corps, our speakers and moderators, members of the ASEAN community, good afternoon. I'm very happy to welcome you to the second of the ASEAN dialogues organized by the Presidential Communications Operations Office, Committee on Media Affairs and Strategic Communications, in partnership with the Asia Society and in cooperation with the AIM. It is exciting to see so many of you people here eager to participate in the opportunities that the integration of ASEAN brings. Asia Society is a nonprofit educational foundation with a mission to bridge understanding of Asia through dialogue and educational fora here in the Philippines, across global centers, and digitally across the world. We are thus grateful for this opportunity to partner with government in today's dialogue, Business Beyond Borders, focused on young entrepreneurs and the SMME community to understand how to access the much larger market than ours at home. The world today has become disconcerting and troubled, with many leaders casting a doubt on the benefits of globalization with protectionist and nationalist policies and pronouncements. We saw the protests during G the G20 meetings in Hamburg. We see little trust among leaders between government and business, between everyone, civil society, and the people. So how do we plan a future ASEAN that is fair, inclusive, and that brings as many people to benefit from economic integration? How can we ensure there is an environment and the infrastructure that would allow our SMMEs to participate in ASEAN trade. Firstly, I believe established business can play a pivotal role by adopting an inclusive business mindset to the way companies build their supply chains, increasing sophistication in technology and international logistics are allowing companies to work with MISMEs, say that, it's easier, uh, are allowing companies to work with MISMEs regardless of location to be part of the supply chain ecosystem. In my experience, there is nothing more powerful than a company creating a long-term supply relationship with another one, especially MISMEs. A long-term contract allows this company to raise capital, improve skills, technology, and standards, learn shared values to grow and expand their participation in global trade. AIM and the APEC Business Advisory Council continues to work on a project to source great examples of inclusive businesses with the goal to inspire this strategic mindset. Secondly, the um, neutral e-commerce platforms like Amazon and Alibaba are the greatest game changers, giving companies big and small access to markets. The whole business culture of the sharing economy and the abundance of data and information are developments that force the evolution of traditional capitalism into one of inclusivity. Traditional business models that benefited from scarcity and the control of supply I think are forever disrupted by equal access to information never experienced before. Thirdly, business support of university-led engineering and technological capabilities 
play a key enabler for entrepreneurs, innovation, and startups. The opportunity to commercialize an innovative idea must be market-driven, and business working with the academe and entrepreneurs play a vital role. As each of us entrepreneurs position your ideas and businesses to access, to access ASEAN markets in a competitive way, governments, I feel, have no option but to play a key role to remove the barriers and to level the playing field. One is we really hope that government works with the private sector to define key sectors where the country has a competitive advantage. In other words, what are we selling to ASEAN? Not just what are we buying from ASEAN, but what are we selling and where can we most positively contribute in a competitive way so that entrepreneurs and MISMEs are guided where the market opportunities are. Secondly, government, we hope, invests in and provides universal access to broadband, smart infrastructure, and the Internet of Things. Third, government, I feel, is now funding university-led research and development, but ideally in the strategic areas that we identify as areas that we can really compete in so that our innovation um, efforts and energy are market-driven. Fourth, provide the highest level of lower and higher education, especially in science and technology. And fifth, be the market of innovative ideas. The DOSD can provide risk capital for products and services needed by government. For example, for disaster risk products and services as an end user, allowing a startup to commercialize an idea. I see great hope in this room with government, the private sector, and civil society collaborating and working on the future. Let us not focus on the barriers today, but instead work on how to make opportunities uh, to be accessible to SMMEs. As ASEAN companies, big and small, search for partners in the Philippines, embrace global values and standards, and reach out. Millennials today, I think, are the greatest. They are collaborative by nature, who share ideas and invest in each other. So despite all the rhetoric we are hearing around the world, creating fear and anger, perhaps the, the new generation of millennials will create a more enlightened economic region that is inclusive and that aims for shared prosperity. So as the song said, so that our spirits in ASEAN can soar. I wish you all a very fruitful day and I hope that we can all work together to bring about a really inclusive ASEAN region. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Doris Magsaysay Ho. Now to say a few words on behalf of keynote speaker, Assistant Secretary Ana diaz Rubenyol of the DTI, the lead agency for the ASEAN Economic Pillars. May we please welcome Attorney Alan Rivote. Honorable guests, notable presenters, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It is my honor to read to you the speech prepared by Assistant Secretary Anna Robignol for this very special event, promoting the ASEAN and the Department of Trade and Industry-supported ideal of trade inclusivity to the Philippine business sector. She sends her best regards and regrets that she is not able to join you today due to an important appointment needed for her travel to Hyderabad, India for the 19th negotiating round of the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, or the RCEP, an official engagement worthwhile in the name of promoting business beyond borders. About 3,000 years ago, the Phoenicians built trading posts around the Mediterranean to increase trade outside its region in the Fertile Crescent, extending to Egypt and Mesopotamia. This early form of globalization is a prime example of how an increase of trade within a region will bring forth the advancement of a civilization in terms of both prosperity and influence. Like the Phoenicians, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or the ASEAN, has been able to grow into one of the most dynamic drivers of today's global economy. 
This 2017 marks the 50th year from its creation in August 8, 1967. This half a century ushered in the momentum for the region's eventual readiness to engage globally. Fittingly, this year's theme is entitled Partnering for Change, Engaging the World. Indeed, such momentum was brought by the dramatic development in the region with new discoveries and experiences in technology made possible by the trading of goods and services between ASEAN member states. It is evident that technology plays a crucial role in the search for an improved quality of life. Now, with a continuously evolving digital revolution, there seems to be no more logical way but to go, but to go and to adapt and prepare for change. A change designed to prepare for a more high-tech future made better with a focus on inclusive growth. This call for inclusivity can be seen in the overall thematic priority for the ASEAN Economic Community, or the AEC, during this year's Philippine ASEAN Chairmanship, which is entitled Inclusive Innovation-Led Growth, pursued through strategic measures, namely increasing trade and investment, integrating micro, small, and medium enterprises, or MSMEs, in the digital economy, and developing an innovation-driven economy. The said AEC thematic priority is befitting the current state of Southeast Asian industries, which increasingly features high technology ventures such as aerospace, automotive, pharmaceutical, and bioscientific. Nothing is more appropriate but to include MSMEs which accounts for 95 to 98% of all business establishments, 51 to 91% of employment, and a 23 to 58 contribution to the gross domestic product within the ASEAN region in 2016 alone. This sheer size and influence of the ASEAN MSMEs call for the development of policies which would ease their cost of doing business within the region, and support activities that would nurture their growth. This can be seen in the ASEAN Strategic Action Plan for SME Development 2016 to 2025, or the SAPSMED 2025, which promotes the ASEAN branding for MSMEs and enhancing the ecosystem for MSME development. This program is expected to enhance as MSME competitiveness to participate in and take advantage of domestic, regional, and global market opportunities with an increased access to financing. Likewise, the Philippine Department of Trade and Industry developed the Kapatid program, which includes Mentor Me, a weekly coaching of MSME owners on different areas of entrepreneurship, adopt a shared service facility or the Adopt an SSF program, which provides SSFs to MSMEs, and Inclusive Business, a program which encourages medium and large corporations to adopt an inclusive business model and link micro and small enterprises into their value chain. The seamless integration of the MSMEs within the AEC and the regional value chains would allow them to eventually break into the global stage. The birth and eventual maturity of such global MSMEs would be facilitated by a workable self-certification scheme to increase MSME utilization of free trade agreements through the increased transparency and understanding of AEC commitments. Indeed, the winners in globalization are not the rich and the developed nations of the world, but those who are able to adopt open market policies, effectively taking advantage of the flow of capital and technologies to be globally integrated in order to conduct cross-border trade in a more competitive fashion. Like the Phoenicians, the ASEAN could be considered as potential winners of globalization through the progress made in the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, or the RCEP negotiations. 
This modern, comprehensive, high-quality, and mutually beneficial agreement has the potential to boost global economic growth, deepen regional economic integration, and facilitate equitable economic development for all its participating countries. Rest assured, every one of us in the front line of the RCEP negotiation remains committed in working together in line with the guiding principles and objectives for negotiating the RCEP in a cooperative manner towards the swift conclusion of this important trade deal that will increase ASEAN trade outside the region. Let me end with a quote from the ASEAN Secretary General, His Excellency Le Leung Min, assuring us of ASEAN's commitment towards openness and inclusivity in trade. He said, Despite more pronounced inward-looking policy shifts recently in some parts of the developed world to fulfill its vision of a community which promotes equitable development and inclusive growth benefiting all its people, ASEAN will continue to progress its regional integration agenda and its openness to trade and investment as part of its overall strategy towards sustained high economic growth and resilience. With that, I end the speech prepared by Assistant Secretary Robin Yol. On behalf of the Department of Trade and Industry, Secretary Ramon M. Lopez, and Assistant Secretary Robin Yol's behalf, I hope everyone will be able to learn new things and be inspired by the ideals of inclusivity and trade which we will be hearing from our distinguished speakers. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Thank you, Attorney Rebote, once again for ASIC Anadias Robignol. The topic for our first panel is MSMEs, Micro, Small and Medium Enterprises, together with the Executive Director for the ASEAN Business Advisory Council, Mr. Hill Gonzalez. and also the founder and president of ORESPA, Ms. Cheryl Quintana. And at this point, let us introduce to you our moderator, Ms. Elizabeth Lee. We'll be giving everyone blank index cards for questions. Please write your name and affiliation, then hand it to our ushers for us to collate and share with the moderator during our open forum. Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, just let me give you a very brief background of what ASEAN BAC is. No? It's ASEAN Business Advisory Council. The acronym is uh, confusing with the APEC Business Advisory Council because it's the same, ABAC. But since they age, they're Asia Pacific, you say ABAC. Since ASEAN is A, ah, you say ABAC. <laughs> so that's the main uh, distinction. So we don't normally say ABAC, we just say ASEAN BAC. But of course, ABAC was uh, created way ahead. So as the name implies, it gives advice. To whom? To the leaders who created ASEAN BAC uh, 14 years ago. So it's been a while. So each country um, nominated three uh, business leaders, business icons, to be a member of this council. So for the Philippines, the three members are uh, Mr. Joey Concepcion. He is now the, the chair, Philippine chair, and at the same time ASEAN back chair, with two members, uh, my boss, Mr. Recita C. Coson, and uh, Mr. George Barcelon the president of uh, PCCI. So you have these three from each of the 10, which comprises the council, who gives advice on policies, you know. But you know, giving 
recommendations and po on policies sometimes get boring. Diba? After, you know, we've been uh, presenting to the ministers and leaders for the past 13 years. And as you know, if, uh, if some of these recommendations uh, don't happen, and you are from business, so most of the time you, you get to ask yourself what is really happening. So now, on top of just giving policy uh, uh, recommendations, ASEAN BAC has endeavored to go through what we call legacy projects. So each chair country, like for the Philippines, like this year, we are the chair, we, we have proposed a project that will go beyond the life of the chairmanship. And we have two. One is the RORO. Have you heard of the RORO? The one that was launched in Davao. This is to link uh, General Santos, Davao ports with Bitung. Huh? Down, uh, down uh, in Indonesia, which is North Sulawesi, which cuts the travel time of the vessel which normally has to go pass through Jakarta and takes three days, which now can be done in a matter of four or five hours. So that is the roll, 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 no? roll on, roll off. It's part of the connectivity master plan, but since we are archipelagic, no? Indonesia, Brunei, uh, Malaysia, and the Philippines, our connectivity is through the marine. Unlike you have the Mekong, they are, have the land connectivity. So it's a start, and we're hoping that after this uh, initial uh, connectivity, you, the next is Batangas, Da Nang, China, and then Vietnam. So many of these are in the pipeline, so after a while, hopefully, by the time we reach 2025, which is just eight years from now, huh? that is the blueprint, new blueprint of AEC is 2025. Launched from 2015 to 2025, 20, just eight years. And we hope to see things happen. Now for the chairmanship of the Philippines, the theme is more or less like the one of the government. Government says engaging the world, partnering for change, engaging the world. But Mr. Joey Concepcion said, oh, let's make it a bit more sexy, a bit more relevant. So it's partnering for change, prosperity for all. And prosperity for all comes at a very opportune time, as what our representative from DTI mentioned. No? This inward thinking or protection that is now uh, coming out again and being revived simply because over the years, globalization has not been inclusive. It has not touched the lives of the ordinary people. So that's why the Philippine chairmanship said, okay, we need to make AEC relevant. And how do we make it relevant? It's simple. We have to worry about the MSMEs because they are the base of the economy. They have the most number of enterprises, about nine, more than 90% of enterprises in the Philippines and average across ASEAN. So they are, in fact, the main focus now. How do you empower the MSMEs so much so that your micro, after a while, becomes small? They become part of the mainstream. After a while, your small becomes medium. So once they follow that kind of growth path, then you can be sure jobs will be created, wealth will be created, prosperity will be created. So very clear concept-wise, but very difficult to execute. So how do you execute? How do you help MSMEs? Well, by now, uh, do I still have five minutes? How do you do? By now, we know what are the problems of MSMEs. Access to finance, access to markets, access to innovation, access to capacity building, or what we now call mentoring, something deeper, more hand-holding. And we in, in ASEAN Bank say, oh, we also have to have a access to platforms. What do you mean by access to platforms? So for all of you in various sectors or industries, 
Are you one way or the other connected with your peers in ASEAN? Regardless of what you do, whether you're in the taho, you're in the uh, textile, well, these are more developed sectors, no? But even the more ordinary, seemingly ordinary businesses, do you have access to a platform wherein you could relate, exchange notes, compare with your peers in ASEAN? If not yet, then uh, you're not just really in interested, if I may say so, because we have been hammering AEC for the past seven years now, since I joined. And it seems to me that those who keep on asking, oh, up to now, I don't understand AEC. Well, many times I'm tempted to say, maybe it's not that you don't know. Maybe you don't want to know. Because up to now, if, if up to now you've not been convinced that AEC is the way to go, then okay, I think you're missing a lot of opportunities. Because what is AEC after all? It's like you're the counterpart of your build, build, build. This is markets, markets, markets. That's all it is. So you need to have a platform. That's the first challenge to everyone. You should somehow link, whether you're a professional, whether you're in a business, that you have access to a platform. Look for it, either in business organizations, PCC, I will help you, or you come to me, let's help you create one. Okay, that's one very clear. Now, the other side of mentoring and you know, teaching MSMEs to get organized and have better appreciation of all of these linkages that will help them improve their business is, of course, the market itself. Because I saw, as I always say, you can mentor everyone till he turns blue. But if there's nowhere to, no one will catch, it's like somebody all dressed up but nowhere to go. Diba? So that's where all this thing of inclusivity comes in. Inclusive growth simply means inclusive business. Wherein you have their conglomerates, you have your large corporations, making sure that part of their supply chain are directed, are drawn from, S, from MSMEs. And those who have gone through some form of training who are ready to step up and be now a, a more formal professional player and become a regional player. So you have to marry the MSMEs and the markets. Inclusive business is not like a CSR. It's not like a dole out. That you're there out of you know, compassion to the MSMEs, that you say, I will source my, my, my supplies, my labor from MSMEs. No, no, no. It should make economic sense. That's the whole point. So we have now, in fact, formed what we call a very concrete platform, huh? Alliance Towards Prosperity for All, wherein you have the big business, you have the chambers and so on to make sure and help and partner with each other, okay? There are many more things I can share, but uh, that's my introduction. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Hill Gonzalez. May we invite Ms. Cheryl Quintana to please use the podium for your presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon. I know some of you lack sleep like I do because of Nadal and Muller. <laughs> but it was a very good mental game and uh, like all of us here, like all of the MSMEs in this country, relent relentless pursuit of success. So let's give a round of applause to each other for energy, for energy boost for success. I used to be a micro-entrepreneur from Laguna 17 years ago with no technical background on business, only armed with a passion for aromatherapy and the desire to prove a point that a homegrown brand can thrive. If not for the prodding of, my DT, of our local DTI, Laguna DTI, and the snippets of advices from my fellow entrepreneurs in the province, I, I think I should have not made it. Knowing that doing the right thing is key, we have to put all systems in place. Indulge me to be a little nostalgic because I am here at AIM. Because five years ago, I was here, I attended a workshop which cost me 4,000 US dollars for a, a day and a half for branding workshop. 
which way, when we identified our vision and my mentor said, he was a Singaporean, she, if you want to be an Asian brand, remove the word Filipino from your vision. And I said, why? Because Philippines is not known for wellness products. It will be very difficult for you to launch it regionally, maybe nationally, but as an Asian brand, you're not going to fly it or it's going to be very difficult. And I said, should I heed his advice? Because for one, he is the brand expert. Second, I paid a lot sum of money to not heed his advice. But then I told him, you know, brand building is like building a house. And if I remove the vision of being known as a Filipino brand, I will remove, I will remove one post and I don't know what to replace it. And uh, that house will crumble in no time. So I told him, let it be difficult. Anyway, I've, I came from rock bottom, so I know there's no way but up. And there we went, goosebumps, crazy as I was, proclaiming we want to aim, we aim to be an international Filipino brand of choice in the wellness industry in Asia. With our why and where, we started shopping assistance to address our how. The government agencies being the mandate is to enable its people. And you know why? I believe ASEAN integration is not about homogeneity. It is about diversity. It is about what we, what we can offer. We cannot, you know, think to look alike the same. So our first stop was DTI. And DTI had so many programs. Up until now, we're being assisted by DTI, but a different department. We are very closely working with, uh, e with DMB now and uh, with uh, the Bureau of Invest Board of Investments. But we started from local, from the ROG, and so on and so forth. Then the next agency was DOST. We were... We, uh, we were assisted by the DOST set a program, which provides a loan but no interest which you can pay in the next three years so that's very good and uh, we were able to to buy our machines for the for the development for our r d you can actually google our brand it's the uh, it's the only rice brand based spa products in the country so rice brand is locally known as darak and we transform that to wellness and beauty products so we also had to shop at Dole at the Department of Labor and Employment. And I was uh, like a prophet telling my, my co-MSMEs in the province, you know what, Dole is not a regulatory body. If you're an employer, you can ask them to hold training programs for your staff. Instead of us hiring consultants to do the red tagging, to enable our staff, Dole did it for us. So we had uh, regular sessions for 5S training, productivity seminars, and uh, so on. Why, SME, why MSMEs are important sh lies sheerly on its number and its multiplier effect. The st according to uh, a recent study, that the, stati the, st the statistics read show MSMEs represent about 95 to 99 percent of ASEAN businesses, depending on which country you reside we clocked to the number of 99.66 MSMEs. These numbers not only show the power of this sector to develop our nation and region, but also the urgency we should address it. If you help an MSME like us grow to employ from 10 to 100 people, and for us, we started less than 10, we are now employing 178. 10,000 MSMEs can employ a million and the number continues to escalate. Also, most of the MSMEs are in the supply chain. So nurturing this instead of importing raw materials, so I'm very glad about DTI's position now to increase sourcing locally from 7 to 20%. You know what's the key ingredient for our wins today? The private sector is seen sans partisan politics as a hand-holding partner of the government to realize its goal of prosperity. 
like what Mr. Uh, Sir Hill said, inclusive business is not about CSR. It should be part of your operations. And we, we also shop assistance from private sector. Through the Philippine Franchise Association and the Philippine Chamber of Commerce and Industries, we were able to tip point to our vision in just short of three years. From a provincial company, we became a national brand through, through franchising and distribution in just three years, which we have lagged behind for a decade before that because we used to be a tall manufacturer for other brands. My friends, like joining a beauty contest, we joined the ASEAN Business Awards for the past three years, and I enjoin you to, to, to join because they are, they are uh, nominating now. And always short of accomplishments, but never with learnings to scale up. Each year, we really wanted to aim to, to hit that goal to be an awardee. Finally, we won the ASEAN Business Awards of, for Excellence in Healthcare last year in Laos. I'm sure you know. The I'm sure you know that that uh, that ASEAN summit last year because everybody, when you go watch CNN, it's flooded by our president. You know, before he went there. So we also have programs with our big brother, private, uh, private companies who help us with business matching, local and foreign. We are actually funding ourselves because we are able to do so now, attending different franchise, different trade fairs, and benchmarking um, business mission also together with DTI to different countries, especially the ASEAN in the, in the last two years. Also, GoNegotio has been our uh, partner for us to give us a platform to learn and pay forward. Why is it important to pay forward if you already have a little, uh, even a little le level of success? Because an inspiration to another micro-entrepreneur goes a long way. And it's like a broom, uh, it's like a walisting thing. You can accomplish a lot more when you bond together because our success will be meaningless without replicating it. Truly, the indicator of success, especially for associations, is when they are ready to share, to help their fellow entrepreneurs, especially through mentorships and facilitation. To date, there are 2,000 MSMEs mentored in just a year through a program we are happy to be a part of the inception, which is the Mentor Me program. We are also able to pay forward through mentorship. Our friends based overseas ask us, what's happening to the Philippines? Aren't you scared? Are, don't you have plans to migrate? And everything. <laughs> and I said, change is achieve, is difficult to achieve with reforms. But milestones can be seen through disruption, a revolution of culture and mindset. And I stand before you to give a testimonial that it takes a whole nation to raise an entrepreneur. Our international journey has just begun even if we brought the company overseas three years ago. When they were, when they were talking about ASEAN integration and I saw a lot of brands coming into the country, I said the doors are open, meaning if they can come in, we can also go out. Even if we are just beginning, we are at the top of our spirits, believing that yes, the Filipino brand can. Last year, I was able to attend a public forum as a speaker at the WTO. One, um, the only um, Asian country represented in the forum. And I say, at the end of the day, only with confidence, that we have something to share, that we can truly participate in a borderless world. Thank you so much. All right, very inspiring, very inspiring speeches. Now, of course, everyone, as you said, um, Kiel, also everyone recognizes the importance and the potential of MSMEs. 
It is the backbone of um, ASEAN economies, making up 96% of total businesses in ASEAN. Now, one of the most common barriers um, to MSME growth are access to finance, technology, low quality of human resources, and sometimes relatively unfriendly infrastructure and regulatory environment. Now, we have a success story, an overreaching guidelines, but a success story that we have here, here today. So can you sh I'll start with you, Cheryl. Can you s share with us in your journey, because it takes you know, what, 10, 12 years to, be, to become an overnight success. And you had to go through a lot. So can you share with the ones who actually are MSMEs right now and who want to follow your footsteps, what are some of the insights that you can share so that they will just learn from your uh, mistakes and not have to replicate? Well, the thing that, we, thing that we learn is that when you need help, you have to ask it. People cannot guess what you actually need at, the, at that period of, of time. But, but when you when you talk about financing, now there are a lot of financing institutions coming up to the MSME, especially the micro ones, and they are like um, doling out already, you know, this assistance. But I personally believe, and that's what the strategy also that we use is bootstrapping on the first year of existence. So whatever resources you have, to, you have to make two of it, and really push yourself to. Uh, leap it, you know, f on, on or level level up after a year because they have to they have to learn a lot while doing bootstrapping at least even for the first six months. Leave them MSMEs alone. And this DTI can can assist. Now they have uh, actually mm -hmm. programs uh, P P three P four program for for the. MSMEs and also mentor me by Go Negosyo, uh, but that's mentorship. Yeah. Yes. So for specifically for financing, I think the the assistance should come in after a certain level of growth has been achieved by the company. Mm. So o overall, Hill, uh, what is specifically being done to develop and support? MSMEs. Previously, you were saying that you know if you don't know what's happening, you're probably not interested. But for the ones who are actually interested, but don't quite, it's not really sure as to what is happening. What is being developed right now to support the MSMEs, particularly for young Filipino entrepreneurs here, and how they can take advantage and exploit the benefits and opportunities with ASEAN, so we can have an ASEAN economic community. I guess one, uh, one item I think that impacts all of us is uh, ease of doing business. No? Uh, you know, I just attended a, a, an ASEAN uh, conference and it was not about ease of doing business, it's about ease of starting a business. Okay, starting a business. So at the end of it, apparently the the direction is that by November, the leaders will say, we are approving a set of principles on ease of starting a business. So I said to myself, that's kind of long and complicated just to approve a set of principles. Hmm? So we were telling them that, okay, actually the problem is not starting a business. In fact, get them started, get the party started. The problem is from starting a business to survival, from survival to success, and success to sustaining the success. I think all our efforts all should be focused more on that. Starting a business, okay, there are different models. Singapore can do it in a day. I think we're in the three months. Cambodia is six months. And there are many real problems that will have to be done at a national level. Imagine we are talking of starting a business in the Philippines, we have a lot of homework to do. We're talking of starting a business in other ASEAN. When after some point, 
you should try to harmonize. If you get to start a business in, Indo in the Indonesia, you should be able to do it in the nine others. That's the concept. And I told them, you know, and this is where business comes in. There's the business voice, which should reach the, the leaders and the government and say, let's fast track on many of these reforms so that, you know, we get to really impact and, you know, people will say, oh, so this AEC is working. It's relevant to me. Because you ask anyone in the streets, you ask them, oh, do you know AEC? No. But you tell them, oh, doing business, you can register your business in two, three days. That thing will be meaningful for them. And you ask them, what was the motivation? The ASEAN integration. Then maybe it will make a difference. And that's just one, starting a business. And of course, as you go through the process, there are many more elements under the ease of doing business. And we're so fortunate that we have a national commission on competitiveness eh, chaired by Mr. Bill Luce, who's trying to cut the bureaucracies, to cut the red tape for each and every step in registering your business. Okay? So that's just one, just to give you a sense of what this council is trying to do to help business which cuts across all sectors. But now if you ask for more, more specific uh, ideas, no? So like for example, as we, uh, as we mentioned, uh, all, this, all these MSMEs, we want them to you know, be able to work in an environment where there's easier access to, actually access to finance is not so much a problem in the Philippines. Banks have windows and so on and so forth. Now there are initiatives to lessen the, um, you're, you're aware of the cash transfer, but they say maybe a small percentage of that can be given to more productive MSME development processes, which have more multiplier and so on. Because as you know, the uh, cash transfer, well, it has a long-term, medium to long-term effect of bringing kids to the school and so on and so forth. We're saying this one will make more impact. There's another initiative wherein there's a collateral free loan facility, either land bank or another GFI. But you know, but you have to prepare the MSME should be eligible to borrow and you know to access this type of financing. There's access to financing cum innovation. You go to our Department of Science and Technology, they go through a training program. After that, they will tell you, oh, you need this kind of equipment to make your processes more efficient, more productive, will give you a loan, zero interest for three or four years. So it's all over the place. So that one, I think, is a very good program, access to innovation, cum access to financing. And before, it only has the budget of a billion. Now I understand they have three billion budget. So I think that's a direct uh, intervention coming from this new administration. The access to markets, as we say, that's where your big boys comes in. Because every business will, have, will take risks where the market is. And the market is where are they? They're in your big companies. But how do you link these MSMEs to these big guys who say, okay, you go through this mentoring program, you get to develop because this is what we need. This is part of our supply chain, part of our value chain. So, okay, we become partners. So those are just some of you know, very specific uh, programs that I think this administration is trying to do. And the same applies, how do you make that into an ASEAN platform? So much so that everyone gets to benefit from the best practices that are happening around. You know, the problem with ASEAN now is that the, ga the development gap between the members are so huge. So you have a Singapore who's leapfrogging and who will be the chair next year, and is already thinking digital economy. They will champion digital economy. And what's at, the, at the, what's at the heart of that? Artificial intelligence. So here you are, the Cambodia, the Myanmar, the Lao. You're looking at Singapore leapfrogging, and you say, you know. And again, business say, uh, wait, Singapore, Malaysia, before you go too fast, you know, you also have to bring us closer to you. You have to less. You have to, you know, make the development gap narrower. So how is that happening? So that the Philippines actually is, you know, part of that narrow, narrowing that gap because we're all interconnected now, 
AI and the uh, Internet of Things also. Yes. How is the, the Philippines faring and how can we narrow that gap? Yes, Philippines is more like in the middle. The, those at the rear is really your CLM, the Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, and Vietnam is already being a mid-sized. No? The problem now with the Philippines for the past so many years, we're like dancing the cha-cha, no? uh, forward and backward. <laughs> you know, forward, backward. So the, and we've been telling, this ASEAN integration should be a national agenda. If there's any reason why this country cannot uplift itself, be more professionalized, be more productive, this is it. This is the motivation. If I will always say, even without this integration, any country should go for, you know, developing its country to the level of, but I'm, I'm also happy to say that the Philippines is, uh, based, on the, based on the commitments that, that I've seen, is seriously, like for example, very clear, ASEAN single window. This is to link up the customs, paperless, so you avoid corruption and so on and so forth. Huh? For the, during the past administration, Philippines, what is the status of the ASEAN single window? Oh, there's a, there's a uh, legal case. There's a TRO. Huh? So what happened? We've not been able to move, but this administration, through sheer, I think, resolve, was able to find another, another way wherein it could fast track, and hopefully by the end of it, to link up with this. So it shows, I think, a lot of uh, decisiveness in trying to you know, catch up with the more advanced members of ASEAN. So one of the things as an entrepreneur, we, I'm an entrepreneur as well, but one of the things that we're looking at really is risk. When you say AEC, we're actually looking at um, competition as well, as well as collab collaboration. Right. So in your case, Cheryl, um, risk and fear, what can you say about that? given your success now that you are also in Singapore. What can you say for the, to the MSMEs who are actually wanting to do this and to maybe follow your footsteps and be successful about risk and fear? Naubos na yata, no, Sir Hill? But honestly, you know, it, it, it's, uh, it's correct, the one you shared, uh, the one shared by Sir Hill, because... Um, when they ask me, Shay, what's the difference between doing or registering your business or you know, securing the permits in the Philippines as compared to, say, Singapore, because that's our first. And I said, it's really more of transparency. You know what you're going to pay, what agency are you going to go to, etc. And I say that it takes a whole nation to raise an entrepreneur because though DTI is doing its job at, its, at, at their best, Business is not just about DTI. There are also other agencies that we need to secure to comply with. I'll tell you a, a brief story. Two months ago, I have this mentorship at a town in, in Cavite. And while I was doing the lecture, the lecture was funded by the local government. And so I assume everybody in the room, about 70 entrepreneurs are all registered. So I asked them, who has the regis uh, business registration? You know, only two raised up their hand. And these two are working in the LGU. And I said, I, I thought all of you are manufacturers supplying to, to, a, uh, mo uh, uh, to a department store. And they said, oh, we are actually borrowing their permits for us to supply. We are just supplying. And I asked them, why? DTI, you can get your, your permit in a day. And I was, you know, I even, I even wanted to give them the telephone number of our local regional DTI. And they told me, uh, Mom, because we have to comply with BIR. And BIR comes in less than a month after you, re you register at the Department of Trade and Industry, right? So this is really a very imminent uh, barrier, you know, at the first step of doing business. And... Transparency is actually an issue there, but I don't want to, you know, to dig a deeper hole on that. But what I'm trying to say is that we are encouraging a lot of companies, of people to start business, and now we have a lot of entrepreneurs or micro-entrepreneurs who have registered 
at the DTI but failed to secure other permits and they cannot level up the business so they end up, ended up just supplying. And I think it, based on our humble experience and what I see on the successes of other MSMEs who scale from micro to small to medium is really brand building. What we haven't achieved for a decade, we achieved in just three years because our, our customers, our, our clients really know that we're steadfast, that they have to buy a rice pa rather than ask them to sell a bottle without the brand. And that, is, that association to the country also boosts up the, the economy and the confidence and the, the supply value chain also, because they cannot just transfer from, from you as a supplier to another supplier of that particular uh, product or, or offering. So I think that that's key. And I, I, I hope that uh, this is a, a golden age for MSMEs, I, I really see, especially with the mentorship that is available for all of us. But I also hope to see that there are more programs geared on scaling up. You know, there's, as, as I've uh, always shared, when you move from micro-entrepreneur to a small enterprise, it's like uh, tiptoeing from one staircase to another, one step at a time. But from small to medium, it's like you have to leap from first step of the staircase to the last step because you really don't know it's a different ball game especially when you do retail it's you know all the taxation and things so i we we hope to see more more programs geared towards not just building micro enterprises but really leveling up also or also leveling up from scaling up from small to medium medium to international so to prove that we really can yeah all right so with that for the summary for this one the key takeaway really is since 96 percent of total businesses in ASEAN are actually MSMEs so the importance of MSMEs are, are key to the growth of AEC but one of the things that we can learn from you Cheryl really is your tenacity and actually holding on to that Filipino branding I think that's one of the key takeaways here, that the Philippine branding is actually going to differentiate yourself from the others, and yet you're going to be able to collaborate and sell in other countries like Singapore. And for those who are MSMEs, who actually want to know more about Hill is here, and then there's a lot of um, resources that MSMEs can actually tap already with the different government agencies that we already have here that Cheryl actually shared, the DTI, DOS, also, DOST. Aside from yeah. BIR, also FDA. And, and FDA. Ah, kasi for the, for the rice bran. And also for the, that, uh, there are, we have a lot of food companies. Yeah. So it's a very competitive industry also, but a lot of our MSMEs are in the food business. So... We need their help also and their transparency. How to secure, how to comply. So, bottom line, kaya natin, kaya ng Pilipino also in the AEC. All right, thank you to our speakers. Time is up for this first, first group of panels. Thank you so much, everyone. That was an insightful session. And uh, for questions, please write them down once again on index cards provided with your name and affiliation and hand it out to our ushers to share with our moderator during the open forum. That is a reminder. Thank you very much. And now for our second panel. The topic is startups and innovation. For our first speaker, let us welcome from the Department of Trade and Industry, we'll be having attorney Christine Alcantara. Good afternoon, everyone. So I know uh, you need a bit of coffee break right now, so I'll try to up the energy by actually infecting you with if, if I come across as a bit of overzealous, you just have to forgive me. It's a very, very tight community, and I'd like to share this with you. So uh, I, I come here to tell you a story, and it's a story about Startup Philippines. And now we're actually in the process of completing the story. And 
we call this Startup Filipinas, the Philippine startup ecosystem. So a brief background, I'm actually a policy specialist for startups and innovation. I have a law firm, Abad al and Associates, and we, we focus and specialize on competition, integration, and uh, innovation law. So for the first slide, I shall start off with a really good, good news to everyone. The Philippines is one of the fastest rising economies in Asia and the world. 6.8 in economic growth in 2016. So what's not to like, right? But now that we're at 6.8% growth, why not, we need to actually take it a notch higher. So next slide, please. We have to actually learn how to compete or go into the next week class. So a bit of a question here. Who here is uh, 23? Anyone? Did you know that the Philippine median age is actually 23.1? Yeah, so <laughs> when I found that out, actually, it made me feel uh, relatively, I mean, I felt old. So, uh, so that's actually the Philippine median age. So we're at 6.8% and we're median age, 100 million strong, 23 years old. So what do we do with this kind of resource? And that's what we call the rise of the innovation economy. The innovation economy is actually the generation of new ideas and their adoption on new products, processes, services, and organizational models. Next slide, please. Then after that, okay, very new breeds of businesses. If we talk about Miss Mies, we talk about food, but now we actually talk about new kinds of startups and digital innovation. So who here actually took an Uber going to this event? Grab car? Who purchases goods from Lazada? Did you know that the largest real estate property manager does not own any real estate? Airbnb. That's what you call Internet of Things. First, we started off with steam revolution, steam. So everything, uh, so actually it made transportation easier. Then everything was mechanized. It's the second industrial revolution. Third, everything was computerized. So at the 1970s, 80s, uh, there was actually chipsets. Then we are now actually at the fourth industrial revolution, cloud computing data science, big data. So now that we're here, we actually at the point that we actually have to adapt. Innovation is not even a requirement, it's actually a necessity. As we in the startup community call it, it's actually pivot or perish. So uh, the question is, how can we catch up? So next slide, please. There, there's actually a solution. It's innovation through startups. Now you're asking, what's the difference between MSME and startups? If you call, like for example, an MSME, for you to climb from micro to small to an actual large enterprise, it takes 10 years. Startups, six months. That's how fast it is because there's actually a technological component involved and either it's an algorithm or it's an API or it's an actually a service, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a software for a service like Facebook. It's easily scalable. And imagine if you have, for example, LinkedIn was bought in by Google at the tune of around $3 billion. Imagine if that $3 billion went into foreign direct investment in the Philippines. How many jobs could it have? So of course, the government took notice. And uh, next slide, please. And as I said before, pivot or perish, innovation is our new business. So innovation is the world is actually merely producing valuable commodities. The next stage is actually how do we make it relevant? So here are a couple of examples in the next slide for Southeast Asian startups. Of course, we've talked about Uber. We've talked about Airbnb. We've talked about Facebook. And now let's look at our own ASEAN startups, Lazada. I, I know a friend who actually does, doesn't have time to go grocery shopping anymore. Actually orders diapers from Lazada. So it's easily delivered to her doorstep. And now I think, uh, Unilever just inked a partnership that all of you can actually order shampoo. If I don't, you don't want to order, you don't want to go out anymore, traffic, order it through Lazada. And uh, a lot of them also, uh, Traveloka, Shopee, and 123, Jobstreet.com. And next slide, of course, Grab. Did you know that the Malaysian government actually created a startup or they call the Magic Malaysia? Because uh, there's a group of people who actually went up to them and said, you know, you, we have this ride sharing or ride, uh, ride booking platform, you should invest in that. They declined. That was Grab Taxi. And there's actually this group of, uh, I know of this one telecom in Hong Kong. A group of uh, Swedish and uh, I think uh, Europeans came up to them. You know, we have this really good entertaining platform for music. You should invest in us. They passed on, it became Spotify. So we have to be very, very uh, observant and looking at the next big thing. So this is actually what the Philippine government does. So 
And this, I'm actually going to here to introduce you Slingshot. Slingshot Philippines started in 2015 uh, as a, during our APEC hosting. It started as an event. Just, let, just to check how far along are we in the digital space. But it grew and evolved in 2016. There was actually a summit held by the Department of Trade and Industry. And then we realized during that summit, Slingshot doesn't have to stop an event. It has to become a real program to give access and opportunities to startups in the Philippines. So the question of the hour here in this forum is, the next slide, what, how do we make an innovation economy? For us to have an innovation policy, it actually has to be, of course, no, nothing less, a collaboration between government and industry. Actually, it's a good thing that I'm here also in a panel with Georgia Flores, who's actually with the industry. Okay, that's a very, very brief uh, introduction of the Philippine startup ecosystem. Okay. Next slide, please. Sorry, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I'm, a, bit, uh, I'm a bit fast. Okay. So where are we now? The Philippine startup ecosystem, uh, okay. All right, I'll adjust to the slide, okay. So the key here is if we want to create policy, it actually has to address the bottlenecks and it has to address the key pillars of how to make successful businesses. So later on, I'll discuss, uh, we've divided in actual pillars. It's capital, talent, density, culture, and regulation. Okay. So next slide, please. So that's the Philippine startup ecosystem. And in the next slide, I'll, I'll show you uh, where we are now. So there's actually a model uh, used by international organizations. Uh, we're quoting Ron Host here, but this model is actually used by tech stars. And there are actually seven levels. We're actually at the foundational stage. Surprisingly, the Philippines is a robust and vibrant startup ecosystem. And uh, in the next slide, these are actually the startups that have exited. Who here has used Chica? Okay, so that's actually a show our, of our age. <laughs> okay. uh, Snapchat. Okay. Did you know that Snapchat, the founder, uh, one of the founders is actually half Filipino? We didn't know. And none of, it, none of that income, when Facebook bought Snapchat, none of that entered into the Philippines. None of that came into the foreign direct investment. But imagine, we, we laugh, sometimes we laugh at Snapchat. I mean, we just put a dog to the face. But the technology behind it is actually... It's real-time facial recognition and augmentation. Imagine what that can do. You can actually operate real-time. You can actually see. And it's, it's, it's something that sometimes uh, can be used in simple technology as Snapchat, but it can actually be used as automatic data science for us. So, so those are the starts of an exit. I remit. Now uh, we actually have a cash, uh, more of bank-to-bank bank, bank bank transfers. And uh, there's also sulit.com.ph. And... When we look at the startups that have exited, now we look at the opportunities in the next slide. So these are the opportunities for startups or budding entrepreneurs in the audience. In fact, when we talk about blockchain technology, everything paperless. All, only if we have what we call blockchain technology or point-to-point -point transfer of data. There's also artificial intelligence, which in fact, is the number one killer of jobs. It's not industrialization, it's not opening up the economy, it's actually artificial intelligence. So we have to be careful because actually our BPO sector is slowly decelerating and we have to be ready for that. Okay. So at the next slide, I'll introduce you to this Philippine startup com community. So more or less, actually AIM is here. And in fact, AIM is an accelerator program headed by no less than Dado Banatao. Uh, if everyone has time after this, uh, after this conference, I invite everyone to look at YouTube, uh, Google, uh, YouTube uh, Dado Banatao, Phil Dev. It's a very, very inspiring story of how one farmer's son traveled from Cagayan Valley and made it to Silicon Valley by inventing the chipset that we use in all computers today. So this is a Philippine startup community. We have accelerators, we have incubators, we actually have venture capital uh, for companies, and of course, uh, we also have the government and the IPO and the DTI. So the challenge now is how do we, in the next slide, how do we accelerate from foundational stage to the acceler accelerating stage? And that's what the Slingshot program, which we are actually slowly rebranding to start the Philippines program is all about. So the next slide. So this is actually, if you want to know the community and our family, it's everyone here. So it's a growing community. Okay. 
So at the next slide, uh, it's actually a short and uh, description of the government uh, five-point action agenda. And after a year of lobbying, we actually finally made it in the Philippine Development Plan. And uh, there are actually five components to this. The first is to foster a culture of, of uh, entrepreneurship and collaboration. Second is, of course, for you to have an innovation economy, you have to address the legal and regulatory barriers. Of course, for innovation to thrive, you have to just get out of the way. You have to make it seamless, you, might, you have to make it effortless. And part of the program's efforts is actually advocating to make sure that business is easier to start and, of course, easier to wind up. Because, you know, nine out of ten startups and businesses, sometimes they fail. You actually use that as expensive but very, very fruitful learning curve or, you know, tuition <laughs> for you to actually succeed in the next business. Dado Banato failed twice. And when he founded his third startup, that the rest was history. And uh, the third uh, a part of the program also is uh, to bolster government support through services and access to capital. Quite recently, the Small Business Corporation has received funding from the government. So now we're readying, at least uh, we're hoping to roll out by next year, a series of uh, funding or uh, financial products available to startups and MSMEs. Because we know not everyone has annual financial statements. It's quite expensive to get one. Maybe there's actually a special requirement like a balance sheet. So we're trying to rationalize the submissions and to make sure the shift from collateral or uh, lending or actually mortgaging something to collateral less equity scare, uh, credit score lending. And uh, the fourth is uh, strengthening ex existing institutions to support the startup ecosystem. And we've actually gone forth and collaborated with the Board of Investments. And later this year, we're going to roll out a series of incentives just directed. I think it's also in the Philippine uh, Investment Priorities Plan 2017. A lot of technologically uh, inclined enterprise and incubators will have a special incentives. And at last is the... Uh, establish a Philippine Innovation Economic Zone. Uh, I'll stop a little bit for this, just to show. Uh, before, there's actually a bit of difficulty having everyone involved. And that last photo, actually last, um, just quite recently, we inaugurated the first innovation hub in the Philippines. It's called QBO, or Kubo. So when they say that, you know, uh, Facebook started, or Google, or Apple started the garage, in the Philippines, we started at the Bahay Kubo. So Kubo is an innovation hub. It's a joint collaboration between DTI, DOST, DICT, and the private sector here represented by Idea Space Foundation and uh, with a donor from JP Morgan Chase. We're hoping to roll out the next Kubo, what they call franchises, to negotiate centers across the, the Philippines. We're now eyeing at least four. So in the pipeline is uh, Batangas, Iloilo, uh, Zamboanga. And uh, we're hoping to roll out more, depending on the interest. And I think Baguio. Okay. So, of course, we're talking about the Philippines. Let's go one step further. What can we do about ASEAN 2017 hosting? So, in the Philippines, uh, we're actually hosting. Sorry, uh, I'm going a bit ahead just to meet the time. We're actually hosting Slingshot at ASEAN. Uh, so, I'm inviting everyone on October 20. It's the annual summit for startups innovation. So, we're actually hoping to invite the big wigs from ASEAN, the big players in ASEAN, one of which our partners is Magic Malaysia, Startup Thailand. And it's a good event to actually also socialize with startup founders and ecosystem builders. So we hope to see and register for Slingshot at ASEAN. And what's next for the program? We're slowly rebranding the program from, well, of course, come from the government, you call it Startup Ecosystem Development Plan. It's not as catchy. But hopefully next year we roll it out, it's going to be Startup Pilipinas. So we, uh, we, everyone here, we invite collaborations. If your company, your traditional company or your multinational ha wants to have an innovation component, you know, you could actually have a hackathon with us. Let's invite solutions. Uh, in fact, last uh, week, there's a hackathon hosted by Impact Hub Manila, which was supported by DDI, and MIT was here. Uh, they're sourcing talent, and it was a hackathon, meaning uh, let's sit down together and hack our way through problems. So with that, uh, I hope, um, sorry if I went a bit too fast, but it's just actually a show of energy that sometimes in the startup community, we have to go really fast. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Attorney Christine Alcantara, for that dynamic presentation. And now let's move on.
to our next presentation from Plug and Play Technology Center. Let's all welcome Mr. Jose Avelino Flores. Hi, good afternoon. Thanks for having me. <clears throat> I don't usually get uh, introduced as Jose Avilino. <laughs> Everyone in the community, in the startup community, knows me as Jojo. So I hope uh, if there's one message I'd like to leave you with, that my name is Jojo Flores, not Jose Avilino. Well, it's also Jose Avilino, but it's too long. OK. Uh, <clears throat> congratulations to Christine and the DTI team. Uh, really, in a very... Uh, uh, short amount of time, relatively, that uh, they've done wonders uh, to uh, really help the startup community here in the Philippines. And uh, with their help, and also with the people at D DICT and DOST, hopefully we can really uh, <clears throat> uh, build a strong uh, startup tech ecosystem here in the country and in the ASEAN region as well. So let me give you a little story of, uh, of plug and play and how I got into the tech uh, scene, uh, it's actually by accident, okay? I, uh, I'm not an engineer, I'm not a tech person, you know, I'm not like Dado, okay? V not at all like Dado, okay? Uh, uh, I uh, actually uh, had my first career here in the Philippines in bottled water. I don't know if Christine knows that or if... Uh, uh, any one of you who knows me knows that, but I started my career in the Philippines in bottled water, in, uh, and I started Wilkins here in the Philippines. Okay, so I was an entrepreneur. Okay, uh, that's really my uh, my beginnings. And uh, after I did Wilkins here, uh, I joined this group in the United States, in the U.S., uh, who who were my friends when I was uh, who when I was at Wilkins. And I built, uh, together with them, bottled water companies in Europe. So uh, I, was, I lived in Europe for almost 10 years uh, and uh, built uh, uh, 10 companies. In, and we were about 40, 40, in, in about 40 cities in Europe. After that, I, I came back to the United, I went back to the United States. And this is where the accident really happened. And I got involved in technology. I remember my wife, in a phone call, said, Saying, Han, bakit yan? Wala ka namang alam dyan. Okay? And, uh, he said, uh, and I said, you know, well, you know, uh, it, it's, it is something new, but uh, it's uh, pretty interesting. And I think more than anything, it's, I, I think it's really the wave of the future. No? So this was around, this was around the mid, early 2000s. So next slide, please. So our group was really involved also in real estate. And there, we had this little building in uh, Palo Alto along University Avenue. It was, the address was 165 University Avenue. And uh, the San Jose Mercury News coined it as, uh, as a lucky building, okay? And uh, the reason why they're saying it's a lucky building is because startups like Google started there, there's PayPal started there, Logitech started there. There's this company called Danger that started there. Anyone here aware of the, or knows Danger? Danger uh, was founded by this uh, gentleman named uh, Andy Rubin, okay? And uh, this was the first operating system for smartphones, okay? So it was bought by, by, uh, by Microsoft for half a billion dollars uh, and uh, so, and Andy Rubin became the first CEO of Android. Okay? So, so these companies started there. And uh, us, we were, we were in real estate, and we had this unique opportunity to get to meet founders, get to meet startups, get to get, uh, understand what this whole technology business was all about. And uh, we had a chance to invest in, in these companies. And so. Uh, we didn't in, we didn't invest in in all, but uh, we invested in PayPal. Okay, so uh, uh, that was that was a great investment. We invested in Danger. Okay, and uh, through a fund, we also invested in uh, in Google. Okay, so we were doing this in the late '90s, early 2000s, and then and this was a time that I was I was in I was based in Europe, 
And then when I came back, I talked with Said and I said, so he said, let's start a new business, Jojo. At that time, <clears throat> the, there was opportunity to buy uh, real estate in the Bay Area. But uh, we said, you know, why don't we scale what we were experiencing, what we were experiencing at 165? And let's buy a bigger building, let's get more startups inside the building, and let's invest more. Okay, so that's what we did. So we, so this building in uh, University Avenue was about 10,000 square feet, and uh, the building that I bought, which is the picture down there, uh, in Sunnyvale, uh, is 175,000 square feet. Okay. So uh, in 2006, in 2005, I looked for buildings and I found this one, bought it from Philip Semiconductors and we, and we opened the doors of Plug and Play in January of 2006. Next slide, please. So uh, fast forward to today. You know, so after 11 years, uh, we've accelerated, I think this figure is wrong. It's not 2,000, but about 3,000 startups since we started uh, uh, Plug and Play. Uh, at any given time, uh, you will there. There is 400 at least 400 startups in plug and play. So uh, there's an open invitation. If you want to go to Sunnyvale at, uh, or at the Bay Area, just let me know, and uh, you can get a tour of, of of the place. But at any given time, there's 400 startups there. There's 800 people. Probably about 250 or 300 of them have doctorate degrees. And, from, and they're from all around the world. About a third of them are from, uh, not just from Silicon Valley or from the United States, but all around the world. People say that we're the largest incubator in the world. I, I don't want to say that, but uh, I, uh, I've, been to, I've been to some, and I, I think we are, we are top there. I mean, uh, one of the top ones there. Uh, what's the next figure, startups? Okay. Uh, yeah, so I, as I said, we do invest in startups, so we, we do review a lot of startups from all around the world. And uh, so we look at at least 8,000 startups a year. Okay, So we do have a big database of startups coming out from, from around the world. One of the big things that we do to help startups accelerate is help them with funding. And we bridge this, we bridge them with uh, our friends in the community of venture capitalists and, and angel investors. And since, we do, since the beginning, uh, we've helped raise uh, for, for our startups uh, $3.5 billion. We also work very closely with large corporations, okay, and we work with uh, about 300 of them uh, from, uh, from, from all industries. You've got power, automobile, retail, uh, telcos, uh, and, and, and the like. We work, as I said, we work with a lot of uh, investors. So uh, uh, with these, uh, with these uh, venture capital firms, we do on the average about at least 600 deal flow sessions at plug and play, okay? Well, let me tell you what a deal flow session is. A deal flow session is a VC will come to, the off, to, will come to plug and play and they'll look at five to 10 startups that they can invest in, okay? So uh, I think there's no one else in the world that does this except, uh, except at Plug and Play. Uh, we do work with a lot of governments from all around the world, including the Philippines. And uh, one of their favorite partnerships that we have is with, uh, with universities. So we work with uh, very, very, uh, the top universities in, in the United States. Next slide, please. So we don't do anything very, very, special, I would say. Uh, did we invent anything at Plug and Play? I'd say no. Okay, what we do at Plug and Play happens in Silicon Valley, so it's just a microcosm of what happens in Silicon Valley. You know? So there are inventions made, you know, so, we, so there's inventions made at Plug and Play, you know, so there's investments done, there's partnerships done. So everything, everything that happens in, 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 in Silicon Valley, I, I like to say that it's just a uh, microcosm of what's happening. Uh, what we do, though, is we accelerate stuff for you. You know, so for example, if you are a startup and you're raising, let's say, for example, a million dollars for your Series A, you can go to, you can take. Uh, there's a flight going to San Francisco every day. 
Okay? It leaves at 10 o'clock or 11.30 at night, depending, no? But 104 will leave and every day go into San Francisco. It's a straight flight. And you can go to Sand Hill Road, okay? Which is where all of these VCs stay. But you won't know your left foot from your right. And if you want to meet people there, you're probably, you're lucky if you can meet two, three, let's say five VCs a month, okay? What we do though at Plug and Play, because these VCs already come to me, okay, I can accelerate things for you as a startup, okay? So if you want to see, so the, the, if, you, if, if in the span of six months you see 30 VCs, I can do, we can do that for you in a, in a month, okay? So that's, what, that's the business that we are in. We help startups by accelerating things for them. We accelerate all these introductions with them with VCs. We accelerate the introductions with them with, with corporations. Okay? And if you want to talk to, let's say, Mercedes-Benz, you cannot just pick up the phone and call Mercedes-Benz and tell them, I have a startup and I'd like to pilot with you. Okay? However, if you are uh, with uh, the community of Plug and Play, we can do that for you with a phone call, you know? There were, a couple of years ago, there was this one Filipino startup, and they said, so what do, who do you want to meet tomorrow? Who do you want to meet tomorrow? I said, uh, can I meet someone from Verizon, you know, this telco? So I, it's a good thing, Taman Tama, I just, I had the telephone number of my friend at Verizon, who was in charge of, who was in charge of uh, their innovation. Uh, and I called the guy and I said, you know, I have this, can you do me a favor? Uh, I, have this I have this startup that I'd like you to see. So they met. He wasn't able to meet the, the next day, but they met that same week. Okay? Uh, so those are the things that we do to facilitate, you know, acceleration for, for the startup. That's what we mean. You know, when we say acceleration, we make things faster for you. We make things faster for you to succeed. We make things faster or for also for you to fail. Okay? Because if you're going to fail, you better do it fast. You fail fast and then do something again. All right? So, for example, after 30 introductions, nobody wants to invest in you. Or no, everybody tells me, it's, pa, it's palpak, Jojo. You know, it, it's, it's, a, it's bad. You know, the team's bad, the product's bad, or whatever. So, we can give that feedback immediately to, to the startup. So your failure is accelerated. Okay, so you don't waste time, you don't waste money. Okay? So it's not just, you know, when people say, you know, you accelerate success, it's not just success. Believe me, I see more, you know, of, of these guys going belly up. Okay, uh, so, so we do help our startups with these acceleration programs, but at the end of the day, really where my business model is, is in the investing part, okay? So uh, right now, uh, I have, uh, we do have over 600 companies in our portfolio, and uh, probably the, uh, the most, the, 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 the best home run we've, uh, we've experienced so far is this company called Dropbox. Okay, so uh, in 2007, when we invested in Dropbox, uh, the company was uh, valued at less than $5 million, okay? And then when we exited, uh, the company was worth 10, uh, 10, B, 10 billion dollars. Okay, so uh, that's probably the, the best uh, home run we've had. Uh, we also have a lending club, which is the largest peer-to-peer -peer, uh, lending platform in the world. They process about $250 million worth of loans from uh, one individual to another. Okay, and uh, the, company's, uh, the company went public and uh, it's worth about $3 billion now. And uh, you have a couple of uh, big companies here also, like uh, uh, SoundHound, which is $700 million business. Way cooler technology than Shazam. <laughs> Little thing there. So, but we do, uh, we actively invest. In fact, uh, uh, I just shared this in my Facebook account yesterday, but uh, I, I learned that uh, Plug and Play was vo uh, was uh, was uh, uh, not voted, but it 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 became now it it's number one 
the number one most active VC in uh, Silicon Valley in 2016. So we did this in 2014. And uh, in uh, 2016, we are, again, the most active VC in uh, Silicon Valley. Okay? So we have the most investments. Next slide, please. So here in the Philippines, next slide, uh, we have Launch Garage. Okay? Uh, this is a little incubator that I started last year. We started this uh, in uh, April, April of last year. Okay? And it is patterned after plug and play. Okay, and uh, so we do have startups here. So if you have, next slide please. Yeah, just a little, you know, uh, just, just the normal <laughs> uh, motherhood and apple pie statements that you, can, you, you see everywhere. But next slide. Uh, today we have uh, in less than, a, in, in, about, in about a year, we've added more than one startup uh, a month to, uh, to our portfolio. So right now we have about uh, 20 uh, of, these, of these companies and uh, hopefully some, one, one or some or most of them will become, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, some uh, big brands for, for, for not just here in the Philippines but here in the, here in the ASEAN. And uh, so this is, what I, this is what we do here in, in, this is what we have right now in the Philippines. I do have an office in Singapore. Uh, I think we've made about 20 investments there and uh, I just opened our office in Jakarta. Uh, we just concluded with doing 10 investments there in Jakarta. And one more, one very important thing that I think is, you know, Jakarta is doing better than, uh, than the Philippines, at least it, for my business, is uh, uh, in just less than in just less than six months, I think we do have ten uh, large corporations, local corporations in Jakarta, as part of our ecosystem partners. What this means is these ten startups that we invested in have immediate access to do pilots with these ten uh, with these ten uh, large corporations. This is something that I think. You know, if there's something that we can learn from or we, we should do in the Philippines is be that, you know. Uh, the thing is here in the Philippines, you know, a lot of our local companies, they think that they can still do it on their own, you know. But that's a thing of the past, you know. Uh, I have uh, Mercedes-Benz CEO telling me, Jojo, in 10 years' time, the value of the car is going to be in the software, not in the hardware. That's why I need you to be partners together. So you look for software companies that will go inside the Mercedes car. I do have that partnership with them, and we call it Startup Autobahn. Okay? We launched that last year. And today we're piloting 13 companies with them. Okay? These are the stuff that I think needs to happen here in the Philippines. You know? uh, hopefully uh, our, large, our large corporations get it, that... Uh, you know, they cannot uh, do innovation alone and they need uh, uh, cooperation and collaboration with other entrepreneurs in the tech industry out there. That's about it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Jojo Flores. And now we turn it over to our moderator, Ms. Elizabeth Lee. Yes, very, very quickly. There, there's a lot of interest here for startups. I think it's, it's wonderful. Um, how can you protect, for either one of you, how can you protect startups from inherent risks of borderless trade? Borderless trade. Yeah. Borderless trade. I guess this is because we're going to be an ASEAN economic community. How do you protect, like if you have some idea that you started yourself and you want to protect that idea? You know, good ideas can never be protected, you know. I mean, like... Google is a good idea, Airbnb is a good idea, Uber is a good idea, uh, Facebook is a good idea. You know, uh, all good things you cannot stop, you know, and you cannot hide it, you know. A lot of a that's the problem with a lot of a with Asians. You know, it's in, their cult it's in our culture, you know, not to share. You know, when, you know, here, okay, you know, in, okay, case in point, plug and play, we've probably seen at least 200,000 startups in the world, at least. 
We've never ever signed a single NDA. Okay? Here in the, here in the Philippines, you know, uh, tell me your idea. Oh, can we sign an NDA? No. You know, you, know, you think you're the only one with that idea? Okay? You, you think you're the only one with that solution? There's probably someone out there that has the same or similar. And I cannot, you know, I, I cannot sign an NDA based on, you know, similar. Yeah. You know, so, uh, so th those are the things. You know, I, I, I don't think you cannot hide it, you know. So what we do, we say you pitch it. Mm. Okay, if it's a good idea, people will collaborate with you. And actually all good ideas, they, you know, there will be many of them that will try to... To, uh, to solve that problem or go after that particular idea. But the best one, that the, the one who will win is the one that best executes. You know, that's at, at least our experience, you know. We had the chance to invest in Facebook. They wanted to buy one of our buildings and part of the deal was, you know, you give us some shares. Yeah. But we had this other company that had better traction with them. They were doing the same thing. Of course, our, our company failed. Facebook succeeded, obviously. Mm -hmm. Right, but uh, you know, uh, but that, that's just the nature of uh, just that's just the nature of the game. You know, you cannot hide, and you shouldn't hide. Yeah. You know, if it, you know, you have to actually pitch it and let people tell you what to do better. Yeah. So, having said that, what is the single? Do you think what is the single biggest success factor for startups? Oh, team, definitely. I mean, it's still people. You know, uh, when we, you know. Uh, I remember <clears throat> Saeed was, I came back to the, I went back to the U.S., you know, I was in, uh, when I was in, in Europe and he said, hey, Jojo, we invested in this company, okay? The, are, are you guys familiar with this pilot, Pound Pilot? You still remember Pound Pilot? The older ones, no? Okay. The PayPal, PayPal's business, when they started, was to beam money from Pound Pilot to Pound Pilot. That was what they wanted to do. And Saeed was so excited, he said, oh, this guy, Peter Thiel, okay, he's really smart, okay, and they want to, you know, they want to be money from Pound Pilot to Pound Pilot. You know, it's like your wallet. He said, huh? I mean, you want wallet? You want $20? Here's $20. You know, it, it, this is my wallet, not the Pound Pilot. You know, but, you know, that's the exciting thing about these things, you know, I, I remember... I had uh, the guys from our telcos uh, many years ago, six, seven years ago maybe, I was telling them, you know what I'm hearing from all of the telcos around the world? Is that the telcos will become dumb pipes and that value add services and content will be the thing of the future. Yeah. Okay? Unfortunately, they, some of them, well, didn't listen, no? And uh, so we're catching up right now, okay? But this is really the, the challenge that we're facing right now. It's, you have to, first you have to be open. It's a mindset yeah. thing, you know? You have to be open that innovation, you know, it's going to bite you in the ass if you're not, re if you're not mindful of it, you know? I had the chief of innovation of Hilton, uh, having, I was having lunch with him like two or three years ago, and he says, I asked him, so why are you here? He said, you know, uh, Hilton is a hundred-year-old company, okay? And uh, it, it's just shocking to us when there's a company that's less than 10 years old that has no assets, meaning no properties, and their, as, their market cap is the same as us. They're also worth $30 billion. Okay, so, uh, and then... The, on, my, on my left side, I had the chief of innovation of uh, National Panasonic. And I said, so why are you here, Sam? Okay. He said, you know, to, for all intents and purposes, after the VHS, we didn't invent anything anymore. Okay. So he said, innovation that's going to be homegrown or purely homegrown is a thing of the past. They're just imagining things. Okay. If you're, if you're like... Uh, leader of a ten billion dollar company, don't don't sit on your laurels and think that oh, all the innovation is going to come from me. That's that's the, really the thing of the past. 
I have 300 large corporations telling me that we have to start collaborating with startups. So building this ecosystem, Christine, here in the Philippines, you know, we can benefit, you were saying in your presentation, we can benefit if people actually invest, invest here. How are we doing since, let's say, 2015 from Slingshot? How many startups and what is the government doing? So for example, like Chile, if Silicon Valley is to the United States, Chile, they're trying to do Chilecon Valley in there in, in Chile, where they actually have, and it's, it's true, and when they actually, the government gives free visa to attract all these entrepreneurs to come and do a startup in my country, Chile. They actually call it Startup Chile. Startup, yun nga, Startup Chile. Chile con daw eh. Chile con. From, Silicon, <laughs> from Silicon Valley. So how are we doing? How are we faring as Philippines? So that we can also attract that talent. And you were saying, so people can actually invest here. In the, in the Philippines. See, the government uh, built this program because in the past couple of years, as say last, let's look at the narrow last three years, there are actually successful Filipino startups, but what they do is they actually, when they get invested on, they move to Hong Kong, they move to Singapore. So it's the number one problem. The investments don't stay in the Philippines. So our aim, at least for Startup Filipinas, the program is to make the investments here, grow the companies here. And, you know, jobs creating uh, more and more, uh, more income for the Philippine economy. So what's the, what's the government doing? Uh, well, at one part, we see when we build innovation hubs, it's actually just a small component. Like for example, in Singapore, they, had, uh, they, they built a facility, but it's not existent on the facility alone. We do have this facility, it's actually called the Kubo Innovation Hub. It's a public-private partnership. But apart from the Kubo, you know, actually, Kubo is just a library. It's actually DTI's international library. Just spice it up a bit. Just you know, improve the lighting. Put a buy Kubo there, and it's there. It's you can actually put an innovation hub anywhere. The more important thing is actually the programs. So the programs that are important is first you have to have there's a startup 101 session. There's access to finance sessions. There's mentoring, and uh, what the DTI does, especially in partnership with the Export Marketing Bureau, is market access abroad. So in the presentation, we showed that we've actually sponsored uh, a couple of startups in the recently uh, concluded uh, Tech in Asia. So we had a booth there, slingshot at a booth there. And I think a delegation now is in, uh, well, I missed this trip because I was, I was here, but it's okay. Uh, they don't need me there. Uh, they need to pitch to the outside world. They're in Hong Kong Rice. Mm. So uh, we've been sending these delegations uh, abroad. It's more of telling the whole world, you know, you can actually invest in startups in the Philippines. And of course, you invest here, you have to make sure that the Philippines is investable. Yeah. So we've, we're, we're actually have a policy lobbying arm. So we're, we're actually uh, working with Congress uh, and, and the House of Representatives and Senate on two important bills and ease of doing business uh, bill. And uh, with Senator Bama Kino and, Sh and Senator Sherwin Gachilian. And on how is that working? Because bill. when Hill said earlier, yes. it's not ease of doing business, yes. but ease of starting a business. Yes, uh, well, it's for startups, it's two things. Ease of starting a business, so everything has to be digitalized, which is the project of the ICT and eGov. Okay. More important thing, ease of closing a business. I mean, um, you need to actually start. I hear that's worse. that's worse. Closing a business is worse yes. than starting a business. Yes. You have to actually have to close it. Because let's face it, not all businesses succeed. And it's supposed to be that way because it's a learning curve. Yeah. So part of it is actually the advocacy part in the program. So we're actually asked to sit in the technical working group, the Senate, in the startup bill. So in this in the small uh, in the small let's say sandbox or startups in the bigger picture is actually ease of doing business for all businesses in general and of course this is actually the main uh, this is the main advocacy of the Department of uh, Communication Technology eGov so everything has to be online so if somebody needs help they can call you uh, the DTI uh, for example it, it it would define our uh, what what help you need uh, the DTI actually has a business matching program. So there's a particular startup that needs bridging with uh, a corporation. Uh, actually, the DTI does that. We just expanded the portfolio of DTI. Uh, I think it's DTI Philippines. Uh, I have to check with the email. Uh, you can just contact me directly. It's slingshot at, I'm not sure, at PH or at DTI for, for the emails. And for we're actually launching the program in this year's uh, ASEAN uh, 2017 uh, uh, summit. Actually, just also to answer Jojo's, uh, uh, he was telling that uh, the corporations have to have uh, access to the startups. We're actually launching that in the ASEAN 2017, uh, hosting what we call the ASEAN 10 by 10 program. It's actually business matching between startups, 
an NGO and a multinational. Because for, for a successful program to be built, it has to be collaboration of all aspects or all pillars of uh, society. So would you agree that if, you, if you're a small uh, MSME, in order for you to supersize me, we would have to, it would be beneficial for that entrepreneur to go to Launch Garage? Well, it's not automatic. Okay, I, I am not, it's not automatic. Same thing with all of the other startups that come into the fold of, of plug and play. Of course, uh, what we do is we provide that platform for you, for you to, it's, it's like, a, like an incubator, it's like a Petri dish, no? So we'll, we'll accelerate stuff for you, we'll help you, we'll provide you with tools, we'll, we'll give you heightened access to the network that we have, whether here locally or in the region or globally, you know? If, if I find something, there's, there's one company, for example, here that was doing uh, uh, data compression and I introduced them to Facebook because at that time, Facebook was developing Facebook Live. Okay, it didn't work. You know, but I gave that introduction. You know, so I, I can give you all of those tools. You know, I can give you all of that. that, that How much does it cost? What? Two. Get into maybe launch garage well, if you have a really. Well, you started. have to. I have to like. Well, I have to like the team. I have to like the team. I have to like the problems that you're trying to solve. I like to. I like to. I like. I have to like the solution, the creative solution that you have, versus everything that we've seen in the in 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 the in the market, and uh, you know we want to see. Uh, and then at the end of the day, you know. It's, I, not I kinda, look into he's the not eyes. answering the question, is he? <laughs> yeah. No, I like to look into the eyes of the entrepreneur and say, you know, is this the guy who's going to make, you know, who's going to do it, yeah. you know, for, for, for us or not? You know? Know, know. What's the largest, what's the largest investment uh, that you've actually, under you, that you've made here in the Philippines for a Filipino startup? Large oh, investment. you know, that's an interesting thing. The 20 companies that we have here, they're all coming to me with advisory shares, mm. okay? Uh, and the, the, the advisory shares that they give me is anywhere from 1% to 5% of the company, depending on, depending on uh, me, uh, certain things, okay? And uh, the investments that we do will come from the network that we have, no? not, not, from, not from Launch Garage. Launch Garage is is the platform. If somebody wanted to be an investor, they could? Oh yeah. I mean, uh, one of the things that I'm trying to do is build the fund. Uh, so if you want to invest, you know I'm building this $10 million fund, startup fund that we will invest in startups here in the Philippines. So, uh, you know, we've ha we're getting interest in the US from Filipino Americans there who want to put money inside the fund uh, and some local individuals here as well who want to get into that into that business. So we'll talk. Uh, sure. But with <laughs> Christine, Christine for, with all these things that's coming up with, with startups, there's regulatory issues. There may be regulatory issues. Uh, crowdsourcing, crowdfunding, how has this, this um, environment changed for startups and what should they look for, look out for, and what can they do? Uh, actually, there's a delicate balance between regulation and startups. Of course, on one hand, you have to permit what you call, uh, you have to have like a permissionless innovation. Meaning, you can do anything you want, just make it disruptive. Like Uber was disruptive. Mm -hmm. But of course, you have to also look out for public good. So at least at the government, there's always a delicate balance not to overly regulate and at the same time, allow for a successful startup to thrive. I think, uh, in fact, the, uh, the government has done a good job in regulating Uber. We're actually the first country that came up with the most successful regulation. First, and I think it's the most successful regulation for, for Uber. Uh, and if, uh, there's a separate, uh, what you call in, in startup community, stand box, or it's like a, a separate uh, category for its land tran transportation or transport vehicle network. So it's under its own rules, so that's good. The Banco Central in Pilipinas actually has a new regulation for virtual currencies and uh, virtual money transfers. So it's good that you actually still monitor, just for compliance purposes, yeah. of course, we, we don't know what's going on there, but you have to also allow for permissionless innovation. That's because, in a way, if you overly regulate, you stifle creativity. But of course, you have to also look out for public good. So in a way, uh, for startups, energy is a bit difficult. 
But if there's a public good in it, like with the public or at least with the commuting public rallied around Uber, the government responds. And uh, going back to crowdfunding, I think crowdfunding is a good idea. I think in the U.S., they pass what they call the Jobs Act. Uh, in Spain, they just recently have a crowdfunding act. Yeah. And uh, the last draft, I think, was filed by Congressman Dax Kua on, on crowdfund, uh, crowdfunding. There's actually a pending bill. And uh, what's doing away is in the, uh, there's actually a requirement in the, securities and, uh, in the Securities Regulation Code that you cannot exceed more than 19 investors. But of course, you have to crowdfund. If it's a good idea, everybody will want to invest. So of course, uh, we want to have- 19 is a very small crowd. Yes. Uh, <laughs> after that, it's a uh, 90 year, it's IPO. I mean, nobody can afford an IPO. Yeah, but if it's right. a good product, you have, you have to actually have source crowding or source funding from elsewhere. But, because how else will you scale up, right? right? So the bill's now pending. And it's actually just not even a constitutional amendment. It's just actually an amendment of the law, a particular uh, corporation code, the Securities Regulation Code. So I think it's in... I think it's set for this Congress, and hopefully it passes. It's the key is at least we're, we're moving, yes. and we're actually adjusting yes. also for in these new times. Yes. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, the Philippines, I think, uh, far from uh, what we're thinking, we're, we're actually a bit more, at least government now, is a bit more uh, reactive. Uh, they have the crowdfunding act, there's innovation uh, bill. In fact, there's a lot of us. Uh, it's, it's more of for us to actually push for, for that to happen. But then again, uh, it can't be all unregulated. Yeah. You have to also watch out. There, I mean, there are rules set for a particular reason also. And of course, it's public good that's always going to be forefront. Right. But you have to allow at least a room for creativity. Yeah. So I think the key takeaway for this session actually is be fearless. Do not be afraid that you're not the only one who's actually thinking of the same thing, but be the first one and also work with a very good team and then invest in the Philippines because we're actually creating now a fantastic ecosystem for startups. Okay, a round of applause please for our speakers for this panel, thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Giorgio Flores and attorney Christine Alcantara. Once again, we would like to invite everyone to please write your questions on index cards provided with your name and affiliation. Now for our third panel, trade and investment. For the first presentation, may we call on from the Department of Finance, Dr. Neil Adrian Kabilis. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is uh, both an honor and a pleasure for us to present today um, about the benefits and challenges of the Philippines in participating in the ASEAN economic community. Um, for us in government who represent um, the Philippines as negotiators in the ASEAN economic integration process, we feel that much work still has to be done in terms of communicating the sense and purpose of the 10 ASEAN member states coming together to form an economic bloc. I think I'm, I'm missing my PowerPoint there somewhere. So. It's Okay, that's oh, there we are. So, um, well, we find that discussions such as this one is actually um, we, we uh, is actually very helpful because we it would provide us with um, a greater awareness of what the ASEAN economic economic community is and why it matters for the Philippines. We may remember that the ASEAN was formed in 1967 to promote um, peace and stability in the Southeast Asian region. However, fast forward to 50 years, the grouping of 10 ASEAN member states has evolved into a forum, not just for, for political security, but also one that involves social, cultural, community, and economic integration. Focusing on this linkage between the 10 member economies, the ASEAN Economic Community, or the AEC, aims to create a stable, prosperous, and highly competitive ASEAN economic region in which there is a freer flow of goods, services, investment and capital, as well as economic development, and reduced socioeconomic disparities. Next slide, please. 
Being a part of the AEC, the Philippines has seen increased trade with other ASEAN member states. In a period of 10 years, trade between the Philippines and the ASEAN has increased from 17% of total trade to 21%. This has made ASEAN an important trading partner for the Philippines at par with its traditional trading partners such as China, the European Union, Japan, and the United States. The more liberalized and increased trade through the AEC has provided a wider range of products and services for Filipinos at more affordable prices. We can observe this, for example, when we go to market and, so, and see more variety of fruits that were otherwise very expensive or unavailable some 15 or 20 years ago. We could also see in many retail outlets these days affordable food products from Indonesia, Malaysia, and Vietnam, as well as health products and clothing and apparel from Thailand. Trade through the AEC has also le led to reduced cost of imported inputs due to cheaper logistical costs and other cross-border costs. It has been estimated that at about 87.5% of the goods we import are inputs actually needed by our domestic industries and exporters for their businesses. Reduced cost of imports under the AEC therefore translates to higher potential earnings and business expansion for Filipino industries. Speaking of business expansion, more liberal trade in the AEC also allows easier entry for Philippine goods to ASEAN markets, creating the avenue for Filipino businesses to internationalize. We have seen some of our big fast food chains branching out to various ASEAN countries as examples of this. Adding to that, there have also been a number of medium-sized businesses exporting popular Filipino delicacies, handicrafts, and other specialty goods to ASEAN countries. Next slide, please. The participation in the AEC of the Philippines has also seen increased investment to the country from the region. In 2005, the ASEAN accounted for only 1% of foreign direct investment flows to the Philippines. Last year, just a couple of years, since the formal establishment of the AEC, ASEAN's share of FDI flows to the Philippines stood at 9%. The freer, the freer flow of capital and investment in the AEC, as indicated by its increasing share of FDI inflows among ASEAN countries, can bring in more interregional businesses and generate more employment for the Philippines. Freer capital and investment flows in the region also encourage domestic structural reforms to make these flows stay out to make this flow stay and attract more, or more of them. These structural reforms, such as investments in the ease of doing business, increasing competitiveness and alignment of laws to international standards, are keys to sustained economic growth, especially in a scenario of increasing interactions in global markets. With more capital and investment circulating in the region and resulting establishment of new regional enterprises, ASEAN member states are also motivated to improve both domestic and regional connectivity, which serves as an additional push for addressing the infrastructure backlog that challenges the Philippines. Moreover, movement of capital in the region with less restrictions also mean greater diversification of investments for ASEAN business, including Filipino businesses, which translate to improve asset and risk management mechanisms. Next slide, please. The AEC as an integrated regional economy has taken much attention as it, is, as it is the coming together of 10 economies that creates a market of 600 million people, which is 8% of the world population. As a group of economies, the AEC has a combined GDP of 2.4 trillion US dollars, which is the seventh highest GDP in the seventh highest GDP in the world. And it also is blessed with a young and dynamic labor pool that is the third largest in the globe. The AEC as a single market and production base also stands as the fourth largest exporting region. What this means for the Philippines is as follows. For the Philippines, an integrated ASEAN through the AEC means a larger market for Filipino businesses, especially those that produce consumer goods. It is worth noting that the ASEAN's market is fast growing, especially when looking beyond the mega cities of ASEAN, such as Bangkok, Jakarta, and Manila and instead targeting the middleweight cities like Chiang Mai, Surabaya, and Cebu, whose consumption growths have been out outpacing that of their respective capitals in the recent years. A feature in the AEC is also the Mutual Recognition Arrangements, or MRAs, wherein certain professions have actually 
been allowed labor mobility in the region. For Filipinos, this means another avenue for overseas employment. Currently, mutual recognition agreements that are being either agreed on or negotiated by ASEAN member states include engineering, nursing, and architectural services, surveyors, medical practitioners, dental practitioners, accountancy services, and tourism. In a more integrated AEC, it is also mo almost automatic for technological diffusion between participating economies to take place. Philippine industries have been benefiting from such phenomenon as can be seen in the improved performance of our manufacturing sector whose revival strategy incorporated the adoption of technologies borrowed from other export-oriented ASEAN economies. We're also seeing the growth of e-commerce in the country, which is in its advanced stages in Malaysia and in Singapore, and continues to serve as a seamless avenue for the conduct of commerce in the said economies. Last but not the least, being part of the AEC allows the Philippines to stand not just as an individual economy in the global market, but as part of a block of economies that is among the biggest and richest in the world. This provides the Philippines with a platform in fostering trade partnerships with other countries such as the ASEAN six major dialogue partners, as well as with other regional trade blocs such as the EU. While being the, in the AEC holds much benefits for the Philippines, being part of the AEC also entails some challenges. Next slide, please. Among them is our competitiveness relative to other ASEAN economies, such as in terms of costs of power and logistics. Lower competitiveness for the Philippines compared to other ASEAN economies limits the investments that we could draw by being part of the AEC. This will also affect our capacity of being part of the regional value chain that the AEC envisions to create. It is also quite known that customs procedures in the country is both tedious and costly. This creates hidden or intangible barriers to trade that cuts the trade gains from the AEC from reaching their full effect. We, hope, we see hope that some of the issues in customs procedures are being addressed through the Anti-Red Tape Act, or ARTA, instituted by the Department of Finance. Differences in legal regimes have also been seen as a stumbling block in pursuing commitments under the AEC. Such differences appear regionally, that is across ASEAN member states, as well as within or between national and local laws of a member state. On the part of the Philippines, as an example, we have been reviewing some of our laws to align them to international standards as an effort to properly participate in the AEC. An example of this would be our review of the Securities Regulation Code and the Investment Company Act, as well as in the introduction of the Collective Investment Scheme Bill, such that we can fully participate in the ASEAN Collective Investment Scheme. Further, the Philippines will also have to work on our incentive-giving laws. We need to review our incentive-giving laws to make them more efficient and effective, given that we expect the entry of more foreign business from the region. At the same time, we also need to look at our judicial procedures and practices to ensure consistency, objectivity, and sustainability of decisions that impact on business and the economy. This is especially important now for the Philippines as we form part of the AEC since the AEC attempts to market the ASEAN as one investment destination and we may not want to be the weakest link in this group. Next slide, please. In closing, um, I just wish to highlight the following points. First is that the AEC provides us with access to consumer goods and factors of production in a wider range and a cheaper cost. Second is that the AEC provides our Filipino entrepreneurs with the opportunity to expand their operations and markets and become global competitors. Also, the AEC motivates us to, fo to foster a more competitive business environment. More importantly, the AEC offers us more employment opportunities both here in the Philippines and in the region. Further, being part of the AEC gives the Philippines a stronger voice, a greater representation in the world economy. Simply put, the AEC is actually serving as a springboard for the Philippines for it to become ever more global. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kabiles. Now let's move on to our second presenter from PLDT Global Corporation. Let's all welcome Ms. Katrina Luna Abelarde. Okay, so um, good afternoon. I'm sitting, I'm, I'm going to present and I'm sitting in between you guys and dismissal. So we'll try to <laughs> make this as, as crisp as possible. Um, first of all, I'm Kat. I've been with PLDT for the last 17 years. So I've actually seen how technology has disrupted economies. I've been right at that front seat, seeing how it's been happening. So 
Just to frame the next few slides, we'd want to be able to show you how globalization, capital, MSMEs, um, how, how it actually plays out and how technology uh, puts it together from the point of view of PLDT Global. Okay, so I just felt we had to put this. It's been 50 years since ASEAN, hopefully to the next 50 and more developments up ahead. Okay, let me just start with a quote from the IMF on globalization. And this is not a new quote, but back then they already said that globalization was about two things. First, it's all about interdependence of countries, and second, it's all about technology. Where we stand today, when you talk about technology, I've always believed, and I think it's becoming more and more real, that technology continues to be the greatest equalizer. You can't take interdependence of countries and technology separate. You can't break that apart. Once technology comes, and if it's good, and if it answers a clear need, then as somebody said earlier, there's no stopping it. It's gonna happen. And you've seen that happen in front of us. Like Uber, the whole regulatory bodies, all regulatory bodies, New York, the Philippines were up in arms, but they're still there. In fact, there's Grab now. There are other variants depending in the country that you go to. Airbnb is another example. But if you ask people in technology, these things are good, right? It's good for consumers and should, and if at all, it should push all industries to move forward and to actually improve and innovate, okay? So let's move on to the next slide. Regionalization, globalization, it's not new, right? It started in the EU. You can have your thoughts on how that's panning out, quite an exciting space. You have, of course, ASEAN, you have NAFTA. Suffice to say, it's gonna happen, right? And it is happening as we speak, okay? Even our secretary, finance secretary, said globalization is the key to progress. So there's only one way for us to move forward and we've got to embrace globalization. And if you ask us, I think a lot of people have said it also earlier, that big leap is all about embracing technology, okay? What are the problems? Why is technology here? Why is it such an important part of our lives? Technology, more than anything, is now here to solve everyday problems. It's so that it can provo provide what we call life solutions. The problem with ASEAN, if you compare ourselves to, let's say, the EU bloc, the US bloc, even if you talk about China, our problem is really all about poverty. It was mentioned earlier that we have that huge disparity if you look at Singapore, I think their average per capita, their per capita income per annum is around $50,000. Vis-a-vis, say, Myanmar at 800. There's just this huge disparity. And in fact, in the early days of ASEAN, the whole, everybody was contesting it because they said that just Singapore and Malaysia were the ones who were going to um, benefit, right, from everything. But that should change. Um, one more thing, and... Um, this is actually where we're trying to bring the company. There's a market actually that's right in front of us. One unique thing about ASEAN is if you look at our diaspora, which is very clear for Philippines and Indonesia, the whole ASEAN bloc is actually net, we were um, net migrant, right? We send out more people than people actually come in. So from our point of view, that is something that we will have to act, it's staring at us, but we kinda, don't talk about it, right? Because they're far away. We have 10.2 million Filipinos outside the Philippines, correct? Most of them are not even within ASEAN. What is the big link there? They continue to be the number one source of GDP. They send back around 1.7 to 2 trillion pesos every single year. It's because of them that a lot of families actually have food on the table. It's because of them that a lot of our youth are able to go to school, okay? So that's something that we will actually have to wrestle with as we move forward. What makes us different, okay? If you look at ASEAN, and if you look at the Philippines, we're actually unique. And I think it's because of our history. We're the only ones with, I don't know how many years of Spanish, 300 years of the Spanish, small segment of Japanese, 
and then Hollywood until today. <laughs> right? We're the only ones in ASEAN who don't eat with chopsticks. We are actually more connected to the West, that's the reality, than we are to Asia. Right? Which is actually a good thing. So that's point number one. In terms of culture, we're unique. We're the only ones in the ASEAN that are this way. Second is because of the growing social, economic, and political ties with China that actually puts us, if we can balance that relationship between the US and China, so good luck to our president. Our prayers are with him. That should actually be a very, very good thing because we can be that bridgeway. And you see it happening, right? We, are, we have been the center of call centers, BPOs, outsourcing. It was said earlier, young workforce, that's right, 23 year old, we're actually the youngest in Asia. So what does it mean? If you're young, it's normally a fertile ground for innovation and creativity. Our role is to make sure that we're able to nurture that creativity and that innovation. Okay? You're actually, then, I don't know if the stats are up here, but we're the number one, we're the social media capital of the world. We consume the most social media. When I was in discussions with Facebook, do you know that in certain segments of the country, they don't even know what the internet is about, but they know what Facebook is about. So when the internet is down, don't kill me, PLDT, but when it's down, <laughs> Globion, dead. But when it's down, no, 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 I, I love them, I love, I, I know Ernest, so. When it's down, they say, shoot, Facebook is down. They don't know the internet. Their reality is Facebook, okay? So that's, of course, our older folk, right? For the kids, we all know what Facebook is all about, we know what Insta's about, and we basically live, live our lives on social media. We are the number one country on social media. And that's because of the youth, right? For the people here who are <clears throat> over 50, you know that times have changed. Previously, we were teaching our, or my mom, I, I used to learn from my mom, right? Roles have started to reverse. We now learn from our kids. They know about it before we do, thanks to YouTube. Okay, the education systems are starting to change. Okay, um, I was gonna say something, oh, go, yeah, yeah, I remember. So all about Facebook. If you look at the stats, everybody on the internet, and this is unique to the Philippines, everyone on the internet is on Facebook. So I think latest stats are of the 100 million people that we have, 46 to 50 million are on f the internet. Every single person is on Facebook. Okay? So that's our relationship with them. Um, of course, we're English speaking. You know that English is our first language, more often than not. Uh, we're service oriented, we're resilient, we're optimistic. Diba tayo lang yung nagbabahana, nakangiti pa rin. You've seen those videos, okay? For our foreign friends in the room, that's probably why you're here. Um, lastly, global workforce. We are a global center of excellence for call centers, for BPOs. We've been number one, I think, six or seven or eight years ago. So now we're starting to move into the higher value chain stuff like um, tech and, uh, right, and coding and all of that. But one thing again on the global workforce is that the diaspora continues. We actually send out more people than, they, than we bring in, okay? So our key driving forces are two-pronged, if you ask me. Number one is technology, why? Because again, we are a fertile ground for what we call digital natives. Because we're a young country, technology is second nature to them. Okay, and people, because again of our attitude or, you know, the way we view life, our ability to work with others, our being nice and friendly and patient, okay? So that is what we feel we can capitalize on as we move forward. Okay, next slide. Okay, so I just have to introduce PLDT Global. So this is a company that's actually been, it's, it's a smaller company under the PLDT umbrella. It's been here for 15 years. It has operations in nine different countries, okay? Um, 
largely in Asia, but we do have operations in the US and in the UK. I took over the company six months ago, and since then we've been undergoing what we call a digital pivot. Because they said earlier, either you pivot or you perish, right? And we're not going to perish, so we're trying to pivot. It's harder than you think, but we're trying. Um, and we said our initial market would be all about the OFW segment. Okay? And this is our why. Why are we here? What is our mission? We've got to come up with solutions that empower and uplift. We've got to partner and come up with solutions, basically, that empower and uplift the global Filipino or we know them to be OFWs. Why is that so? Because there is a huge irony. The irony is, they actually, as a, as a group, they sent the largest money back home. They are a driving force of our GDP, but they are, you're lucky if they're second class citizens where they live. They're probably third class, even. We don't even have a database of all of our OFWs. Do you know that? Okay, so it's a very pained market, and earlier, people were talking about all about technology solving problems. If you want to solve problems, there's a lot of, there's a huge list of need spaces in this market. Okay? I have a, do you want to watch the video? It's like a 20 minute video. No, no, no. How long is it? <laughs> three? You can sit through three minutes? Okay. So I, I just want to be able to, yeah, let you guys, these were real clips of, yeah, see, go, go, go. Ako si Marinela Cortez, ako ay 54 years old, chemistry teacher ako dito sa Amerika. Ako si Genesis Castillo, galing ako sa San Pablo City, sampung taon ako dito. Maggio Descalzon na po, na 15 years na po. Na-hire ako as cosmetic chemist. So, gumagawa ka ng mga makeup, lipstick, kung ano, nung baka pang paganda ng babae. As a live band singer. Ako naman ay nagkatrabaho sa isang banko dito sa London. Para po ma makatulong sa pamilya ko. Para magkaroon ng magandang anak ng asin. Sa pamilya ko. Sa pamilya ko. So, communication, technology, and also the discipline of the Okay, ang mga benefits din dito ng bigay ng gobyerno para sa mga tao. Magbigay mo yung mga pangangailangan ng pamilya mo, lalo-lalo na yung mga pangangailangan ng anak at mapag-aral sila at mapatapos sila ng pag-aaral. Nakikita ka na hindi mo kinikita sa Pilipinas. Ano, Na-enjoy namin mag-asawa yung bonding ng dalawa kahit may dalawa ka dito. Iba na susuportahan ko yung hindi ko lang kaya lang suportahan. Kapag naalala ko sila, tumatanda na mga sakit, yun, hindi mo ko tapos. Ano pa ko sa Pilipinas dalawa yun? Ah, sa isa po. Hindi ko na nangita ko ng tawag ako. Oh, talaga? Sa hindi kita lang ako sa Facebook. Napakahirap dahil pag may bata ka, unang-una, walang ibig mag-alaga ng anak mo. Sana yung sila yung patapos sa pag-aaral, na sa ganun, eh, ang buhay nila ay maging masarap din. Kahit iwanan ko sila, hindi ako mag-iisip na sila ay yung nakakaawa. Ano na naanagaan mo yung pamilya ko? Ayoko. Ay, Iba yan. Masarap na pakaramdam. Mapatapos ko yung mga anak ko, mapa mapaayos at mapatapos ko rin yung bahay ko pinakamalaking achievement sa buhay. Okay, so... Next. So a lot of the things that we're doing, again, are around this market. Um, we're trying to understand exactly what the pain points are and where we can enter. Uh, so these are the highlights. 10.2 million of them are out there. Uh, 
26.9 billion, that's 1.7 trillion pesos in terms of remittance. But you know, the biggest insight is that they don't actually know where the money goes. Or the money doesn't go to what it's intended for. Okay? 76% um, are still household service workers and unskilled workers. Um, never mind the last one, but okay. So this is where they are. Okay? Clearly a huge block in the US and Canada but they're already migrant in nature. Then you'll see a lot of them dispersed over Asia. Uh, the Middle East is growing like anything. Of course, you have your seamen, that's 4%. And then you have uh, people out there in the UK, okay? 43% are skilled workers, um, and you can find them in the Middle East block. 33% are household uh, workers and unskilled workers. A lot of them are dispersed around Asia, some in Europe, right? And the good thing, though, is that the professional segment is starting to rise. So if you look at Singapore, for example, that market has already shifted, where you have 40% on the household side and you have around 60% what you call uh, professionals, right? There are also a lot of our nurses in in Europe and uh, America, so they also comprise the professional side. Okay. Of course, our job is to, <laughs> and our head of uh, business development is here, Hal Albert Birela. So if you want to go abroad, please uh, contact him. <laughs> so our job really is to be present where they are. It's number one. We're not here to sell IDD services, or that's dead. We know that, right? They don't call anymore through your, I mean, everybody is already on Facebook, as I did mention earlier. But that's what we want to do. The question is, what conversation do we drive when we're out there? What is it that we offer? How can we actually really live up to our why and our mission of uplifting and empowering? So what we're building, or what we're trying to build, is an ecosystem, OK? We're pivoting into a company that will be about three things. First is data and analytics, and we can do that only because, remember at one point, we were hauling in five billion minutes in terms of calls. So we actually know where those calls originate and we know where those calls drop. That's a huge start. Number two, as they move out, they bring our SIMs. SIM cards, right? They like keeping the SIM cards. We know exactly where they are, right? And then we've just got to be able to build platforms around that so that we can just continue and continue to get to know them. So number one, it's all about data. Number two, it's all about content. Content is what's going to drive them back. Okay? And number three, content. And number three is an open API platform. Basically, a platform, we build the platform, we build the APIs, and we allow partners to come in. Our philosophy is the more the merrier. Whoever wants to participate in this ecosystem should be allowed to do so, okay, at some point. So this is the ecosystem. You have the Pinoy's overseas. You have the money flowing back. So clearly that's financial services. You have the families here. A lot of families here, rev right, depend on remittances, correct? The problem is from this guy's side, they're not financially literate. All they do is they send money. In fact, sometimes they tout themselves as ATMs, right? Because all they get is a message, send money, and the money is sent, okay? In fact, there was this big insight. Somebody, we, we figured this out, and somebody said that the longer somebody stays abroad, the more in debt they become. So we've got, we want to change that, right? At some point, they have, not, to not only be financially literate, but actually financially free. I don't work for an insurance company, <laughs> right? They should be able to provide first and foremost for their needs, for the needs of their family in the way that they want to. And our platform should allow them to do that. Another um, big market that we're looking at is actually, because today, most of our transactions are B2C, meaning us to the consumers and then to the families. What we're also trying to build, again, I mentioned that API platform, is where businesses, other businesses, 
can actually participate in the ecosystem. If you talk to real estate companies, remittance companies, time's up, okay. Financial companies, everybody wants to sell to the overseas Pinoy, right? But you don't, they don't have a facility to do so. So the platform hopefully will allow them to participate. Okay? So that's it for us. Oh, yeah. So these are high-level business models uh, for the ecosystem that we're building. The tie-in to the MSME is that most of the money that fuels micro businesses come from overseas. So that's a study that we made three years ago. So it's a good way to be able to really be there and capture the money before it even comes in and make sure that it goes to its rightful place. Okay, so that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Katrina Abelardi. Now we turn you over to our moderator, Ms. Elizabeth Lee. All right, we're time's up na nga eh, pero quick question lang. Yeah. Kasi this is so important, no? Uh, technology really is important for inclusive growth, yeah. basically. That's, that's, that's what you're doing that. And then one of the key um, insights that, that you were saying is what? Not against the other company, yeah. but, but as PLDT Global uh, and your reach, all the analytics that you're doing, can MSMEs actually have access to those? How do you share that information so you can now increase this inclusive growth by what you are doing? Yeah, so today it's not yet there, but that is what we intend to build. Um, at some point, if you are able to come in into that API, meaning you're able to participate in that platform, and people earlier were actually talking about, like Hill was talking about, be part of a platform, yeah. right? When you're part of a platform that already comes with analytics, so the analytics should actually allow you to target better. It should allow you to see what works and what doesn't work. Um, so today, it isn't there. Honestly speaking, the first ones who will onload into, onboard into the platform sh will always be the bigger guys. Mm -hmm. That's the reality right. of things, right? Mm -hmm. But at some point, if that works, then it just kind of snowballs. One more thing about platforms is that they don't necessarily have to be just for one market. You can break them up, put it together, and then target other markets, mm -hmm. right? So, so at least we have that to look forward to. That hopefully you're going to be at some point, yeah. yeah. Okay, and then one question for Dr. Neil. Who's the winner here for ASEAN and in the AEC? Who's the winner? Yeah, okay. yeah um, actually, um, well, the AEC has always been um, intended to be um, a cooperation between um, the ten economic, um, um, the ten economies, the ten me member economies, and I would say that at the end of the day, um, well, the clear winners for this one would actually be um, businesses based in ASEAN, and also as well as um, the the labor pool that you have in ASEAN, because the concentration of the efforts on the AEC is actually exactly trying to um, market. Um, all these ASEAN businesses available as investment destinations for um, investors that are outside. Are um, we ASEAN. feeling the trickle-down effect here in the Philippines? Well, yeah, we, we do are seeing a couple of, um, a couple of um, interests already. Um, we had, uh, for example, um, sometime in April, we had this um, investor seminar that we did um, in, um, in Cebu alongside the finance minister's meeting. And um, from there, we were able to um, actually gather as much as about 300 potential investors um, who are interested in um, looking into the region, including that of the Philippines. Mm -hmm. So trickle down all the way to the MSMEs, Filipino. Yes, yes. SMEs. Um, yeah, because I think that, well, there is actually also a very um, strong emphasis or concentration um, on um, actually having M MSMEs reap the um the benefits of ASEAN integration um when, when when I go into a meeting with DTI and when we plan um our uh our strategy in terms of negotiating the ASEAN commitments um the what, what has always been stressed by DTI as well as NEDA is to actually um make sure that um MSMEs would find a way to get into what they call as the regional value chains because um for um, as what we have seen, it seems like um, the MS, MSMEs being part of the um, regional value chain are the ways by which they could really internationalize and they could really grow. All right. Okay, so I'm getting a time's up, but I think here, but the the summary for the whole for the whole session actually for for today, um, the takeaway is do not fear. 
And um, the, uh, there's actually a, a positive uh, influence and positive impact on small businesses and SMEs by participating in this ASEAN economic um, community. So a round of applause for our last speakers, please. Thank you so much, Dr. Kabilis and Ms. Abelarde. And also a round of applause for our moderator, Ms. Elizabeth Lee. Thank you so much. That was a very swift yet meaningful discussion that we had right there right now. Now to give us a synthesis and a closing of thank you so much for me now take your seats. <laughs> and now to give us a synthesis and closing of the session, may we invite from the Asian Institute of Management, Professor Fernando Rojas. Let's give him a big warm round of applause everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank the, all the organizers for including AIM in this very important undertaking, but uh, just some sort of um, uh, owning up to, I am uh, not only a full faculty here, full-time faculty here, but I'm also an executive director of the Andrew Tan Center for Tourism, so I shall just include some insights about how tourism fits into all of these discussions, right? So. Uh, essentially, individual countries, the members of ASEAN, are by no means a major economic mover and shaker of things. But as an economic bloc, it is equal to the sixth largest global economy and third in, the, in Asia after China and Japan. Globalization has certainly been a boon for the ASEAN member countries over the last 50 years, and we just need to look at the growth rates of the ASEAN members in the last five years to know that this is true. Uh, Many of our panelists talked about uh, startups through entrepreneurship having been increasingly prevalent for developing economies, especially in ASEAN. Most key players in society, policymakers, academics, entrepreneurs themselves associate the strengthening of MISMES, borrowing the term from uh, Madame Magsaysay Ho, as positively correlating with society's well being. This is consistent with the Schumpeterian perspective that view entrepreneurs as the catalysts of innovation and promoters of structural change in the economy as they introduce new competition and contribute to productivity, job creation, and national competitiveness. Entrepreneurs that eventually become part of the mismatch sector play a vital role being enablers that create wealth and jobs in the economy. An excellent example is Urispa by Ms. Uh, Cheryl Quintana and I've actually sent some of my foreign students to her store and they love her products. And the nice thing about it is that she's actually gearing up to increase her capacity by 500% in preparation of you know, facing that competition from the rest of ASEAN. The ASEAN, uh, well, one of the bright points that actually was highlighted was the role of startups uh, and I think that would become really important because of three reasons. First, we have a very young population, 23 years old, the average age is tech savvy, the social media capital of the world, and Filipinos by nature are creative and innovative. Right? So we creating new things, testing new combinations is part of our psyche. However, for startups to fluster, uh, to, to, to become successful, the ecosystem must be present, else they will go and do their business somewhere else. You know, as uh, clearly uh, stated by uh, the last speaker, Kat, technology will be the great equalizer for us. And our people who has learned to embrace globalization will hopefully make it inclusive to address the issues of poverty including those, the issues of the 10.6 million OFWs that she has cited. Um, the ASEAN possess a diverse mix of industrial and agricultural products. One of the major challenges is that small value added and weak linkages between agriculture and industry. To address the low productivity and alleviate poverty in the rural areas, we must create ecosystems that are conducive for mismatch through provision of necessary financial, marketing, and institutional support for starting and sustaining new businesses. 
ASEAN's total trade in 2015 stood at 2.3 trillion US dollars, accounting for 7.6 share of the world's total trade. That's a huge amount. While this achievement is impressive in itself, increasing global competition will challenge ASEAN to maintain or even increase its competitiveness of its goods and services. That's why the idea, I think, of using ASEAN as a branding platform for MISMIS sounds like a good idea. In 2015, ASEAN was also the fourth largest recipient of foreign direct investments in the world. With increasing global trade and competition from various markets, MISMIS needs to be sustainable to increase their competitiveness. Private sector for increasing competitiveness has to be backed by public sector enhancement of its own workings. As was mentioned earlier, let starting and closing a business be an easier experience for everybody. Transparency is the key. Road transport and utilities are needed by enterprises and their value chains for producing and moving goods and services and labor efficiently. Although ASEAN has made progress in improving major thoroughfares, connecting the major urban centers, economic zones, and tourism sites, there is still a need to enhance the transport link that would ease better logistics. And I think the Mindanao Bimpiaga Rora project is really a good idea. The ASEAN region has increasingly received attention as an investment and tourism destination. In order to continuously provide products and services of excellent quality, Priority should be given to the development of an environment conducive to keeping and attracting more investors, entrepreneurs, and visitors. Recent tourism statistics show that five countries have showed the highest increases in leisure travel worldwide. These five countries, in order of, incre of uh, the largest increases, are Indonesia, Thailand, Korea, Malaysia, and Taiwan. Note that three of these are members of ASEAN, while the other two are ASEAN neighbors. Uh, for my own advocacy, I think tourism is ideally suited to the Philippines because one, we enjoy, uh, it can employ a wide variety of people with different educational levels and skills, which manufacturing can't really do. Filipinos are naturally hospitable and gracious, which is our natural gift. We can, the tourism industry can earn as much as OFW remittances, which is what Thailand has shown, without requiring a single Filipino to work abroad. The Philippines has many attractive and natural tourism endowments that we cannot deny. We just need to run and market it better. However, the Philippine archipelago is by nature geographically disadvantaged because it's isolated from the rest of ASEAN. In terms of infrastructure, we are the last mile connection to the ASEAN power grid and the ASEAN natural gas pipeline. In terms of tourism, we are physically detached from the Mekong country value chains that benefit mainly Thailand, Malaysia, and Vietnam. Also, High power, logistics, and customs costs make us hardly competitive in the, market, in, in the manufacturing sector. In short, we have to be really smart to benefit from the ASEAN integration initiatives. We must plan ahead and be strategic in our choices of industries and develop inclusive supply chains. And I think Hill was right. The mantra should be market, market, and more markets. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Rojas. And that concludes the second ASEAN 2017 dialogue, a three-part dialogue series and webinar on ASEAN's three pillars. We'd like to invite everyone to attend the upcoming third leg of the ASEAN 2017 dialogues, ASEAN Identity. This will focus on ASEAN's social cultural pillar and what ASEAN means to you. This will be on July 31, 2017. Please mark your calendars, same time, same place. Still live on the ASEAN 2017 Facebook page. Thank you and stay tuned and hashtag ASEAN 2017 Dialogues for more updates. Have a great Tuesday, everyone.